Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Accounts of haunted lighthouses have existed for hundreds of years. To many, they are considered to be isolated and romantic. Some lighthouses are possibly haunted due to tragedies from shipwrecks or other horrors that have spawned all sorts of lighthouse lore. Some who have spent the night at a haunted lighthouse come away with stories to share such as seeing a former lighthouse keeper or resident of the keeper's home. Could they still be present in some form after their death? Could keepers possibly remain behind to make sure no further tragedies occur at sea? Perhaps the worst fear of a lighthouse keeper, a ship wrecked upon the rocks, is why some lighthouses continue to be haunted by their former captains. Lights turning on, movement of objects, disembodied voices, and see-through specters – they're all often reported within or around older lighthouses. Are the ghosts of these souls still on duty? Modern-day tragedies at sea still occur, and so do the ghosts that eventually haunt our world. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. A seal book. Presents Suspense. I am the whistler. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, if their walls could talk, lighthouses could share many stories from the past. Unfortunately, these objects don't have the ability to tell their tales, but the phantoms that haunt them just might. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, Twitter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour.
case of the lonesome corpse. Remember Hugo Carteret? Well, of course you do. The brilliant criminologist and charming gentleman who had such a wonderful flair for solving crimes which carried a hint of the macabre and savoured of the supernatural. He died back in the 20s. And they say that everybody from the 400 of Park Avenue to the 400,000 of the Bowery and Hell's Kitchen came to his funeral. Anyway, Hugo Carteret left his memoirs. And the very first chapter deals with an infamous crime which in June of the year 1922 threw all of New York City into an uproar of horror. Such was the case of the Lonesome Corpse. Greystone Park used to be the private estate of old Caleb Greystone, eccentric Greek use and incidentally millionaire many times over. When Caleb died, he willed the estate to the city of New York. The city fathers, properly grateful, promptly converted the estate into a park. It was public in that it was open to the public, but it had a private look because a 15-foot wall of polished stone completely surrounded it. One day, back in June of 22, a big car drove up to the only entrance. In the back seat of the limousine was William Marsden, wealthy lawyer and executor of the Greystone estate, and he had come to inspect the grounds. You wait here in the car, Edward. Yes, Mr. Marsden. Will you be long, sir? I don't think that's any of your business. I pay you to chauffeur me around, not to ask me questions. Yes, sir. I was only bringing up the fact that it's getting dark, and you said you had to be at the plaza by nine. I'm perfectly able to take care of my own business, Edward. I'll mind mine, and you mind yours. Now, you wait here in the car till I'm through in the park. Understand? Yes, Mr. Marsden. Greystone Park. We go case, shrouded in mystery as police fail to find clue. Read all the body. Hey, Joe. Yeah? How do you suppose that big shot lawyer Marston disappeared? Think his chauffeur had something to do with it? I don't know, Tom. I don't get it. He tells his chauffeur to wait, walks into this here park and never comes out. Chauffeur hears a scream inside the park, and that's all. Uh, you scared too easy, Tom. Ah, uh, nine, that's nice. Just broke my shovel. Well, I have to go over to the tool house and get another one. But, Joe, the tool house is way over the other end of the park. So what? It's getting dark. And it ain't healthy to be in this place after dark. Let's knock off, Joe. We can finish digging these flower beds tomorrow. If we knock off, we'll both be looking for a new gardener job tomorrow. Andrews, the superintendent, told us to finish up tonight. And that's what we got to do. Look, Joe, I, don't leave me. I got an idea there's something running around this park we don't know nothing about. When I think of that lawyer, Marston, I... <laughs> so, you seen ghosts now, huh, Tom? <laughs> well, there ain't no ghost or nothing else that can scare Joe Donetti. You wait for me here. <laughs> and if you see a boogeyman, well, just offer him a drink and uh, ask him to stick around, eh? <laughs> extra, extra, Greystone Park claims second victim. Park Gardner leaves companion for tool house and never returns. Police call in Hugo Carter on his public demand solution. Read all about it here, extra, extra. Police headquarters, Sergeant Hogan speaking. What? You saw a light floating around in Greystone Park? What kind of a light? Purple, eh? You see anything else? What? A white ghost walking down the park road, eh? All right, all right, don't get excited. We'll send a squad car to investigate right away. 
Hello, Sergeant Hogan. Oh, hello, Mr. Carteret. Miss Smith. Oh, I see you know my special assistant. Of course he does, Hugo. The sergeant and I are old friends. We met at the policeman's ball. Oh. Keeping you busy these days, Sergeant? Busy? Mr. Carteret, we sure need your help in this case. The commissioner's going nuts inside. And you ought to hear the double talk coming in over this wire. <laughs> this Greystone Park business has got the people living around there walking around in circles. They're seeing everything from the king of the pixies to the ghost of my great-grandmother. I don't wonder. I've been working up a few shivers about it myself. Is Commissioner Williams in, Sergeant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go right into his office, Mr. Carteret. He's expecting you. Thank here, you. Here comes another screwball report. <laughs> Come on, Ann. Police headquarters. Sergeant Hogan speaking. What? You heard some kind of animal howling in Greystone Park? What kind of animal? So, Joe Donati left you to get a new shovel, eh, Farrell? And then a little later, you heard a scream. Yes, sir. It come from far off, and it must have been Joe. Oh, oh hello, Hugo. Miss Smith? Commissioner? Hi, well, I guess that'll be all, Farrell. Stay pretty close to home, though. We may need you later. Yes, sir. Oh, that was Tom Farrell, the gardener. Hard to get anything out of him. He's so jittery. He's convinced there's some kind of murdering thing running around loose in that park. So is Mars and the chauffeur. And I'm convinced they're both telling straight stories. I trust you've searched the park thoroughly, Commissioner. Oh, of course I have, Hugo. At a detail, practically scrape every foot of the area with a fine-tooth comb. And you found nothing, Commissioner Williams? Nothing. Until yesterday morning. Oh, you have a clue? Yes, if you want to call it that, Hugo. But, well, it's almost incredible. Fantastic on the face of it. Hugo, we need your help badly. We're at our wits' ends down here, and, and I haven't even asked you. Well, naturally, Commissioner, I'd be delighted. There's a touch of the macabre and supernatural here that I find very interesting. Don't you, Anne? I'm not so sure. Now then, Commissioner, you said something about a clue. Yes. Donetti, the missing gardener, was wearing hobnail shoes. The road was soft in the recent rain. And we were able to trace his footsteps as far as they went. What do you mean, as far as they went? I mean those footprints stopped dead in the middle of the road. What? right next to Caleb Greystone's tomb in the center of the park. It was just as though some giant bird of prey picked Donetti up and carried him off. But, my dear Williams, that doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't, but it happened. Donetti couldn't vanish like that, unless he had wings. Maybe he does have wings now. You know, Anne... I can't get those footprints out of my mind. They interest me. They scare me. In fact, I think I'll stop in at Greystone Park and have a look at them. You mean now? Yes. Oh, but Hugo, it's midnight, and there's something dangerous roaming around in that park. Something deadly. Why not wait until tomorrow in the daylight? Because the things that happen in Greystone Park, Anne, seem to happen at night. <laughs> Here we are. Yes. Peaceful, serene, Greystone Park. The place that people just hate to leave. You should have let me drop you at your apartment, Anne. This is no place for a girl. Oh, no, Mr. Carteret. I'm going right with you. Well, here's the gate. It's the only entrance or exit. Let's try it. Now, neatly locked with a heavy iron chain and padlock. The police want to keep people out, and I think it's a wonderful idea. Either that or they want to keep something in. The thing in this park couldn't be stopped by chains or padlocks. Well, they're not going to stop us either. Here, Anne, I'll boost you up to the top of this stone wall and climb up myself. Come on. Uh, there you are. How's the view up there? Oh, lovely. Now then, Mr. Carteret, let's see what kind of a second-story man you are. I haven't done this... Since I was a boy. <laughs> this wall is higher than it looks. You all right, Anne? Just dandy. Well, now, I'll drop down and, and then catch you. All right, Anne. Just let yourself go. All right, but don't miss. There you are. Shh. Listen, what was that? Only the wind. Oh, I, I thought I heard someone calling. Why, Anne? You're trembling. You're telling me. Hugo, where are we going? Up this road until we reach the place where that missing gardener's footprints stopped. It's right next to that big square tomb in the center of the park, according to Commissioner Williams. Mm-hmm. 
That's the Greystone Mausoleum. All that remains of old Caleb Greystone, the philanthropist, lies within it. And that's the statue of old Caleb himself standing on the roof of the tomb. How nice. I hope you realize that William Marsden and Joe Donetti walked along this same road at night. And they did... <gasps> What's wrong? I felt a cold hand on my face. That isn't a hand, it's a leaf on the end of a twig. Poor kid. You're frightened, aren't you? Who, me? I'm scared to death. I'm so scared my hair's standing on end. It's ruined my permanent. Oh, oh. Hugo. What is it, Anne? That statue on the top of the mausoleum. The statue of Caleb Greystone. Yes. Well, what about it? It moved. What? No. No, wait a minute, Anne. Hugo, I, I tell you, it moved. I saw it lift one of its arms and, and turn its head in the moonlight. Now, now, Anne, it's just that you're on edge. What you saw was a mirage brewed out of moonlight and your own imagination. That statue's made of stone. Stone statues don't move. Come on, we leave the road and go down this hollow. Well, here we are. Here's the tomb. And here's Donetti's footprints, just as the commissioner said. They're pretty faint, but... Wait a minute. What, what is it, Hugo? Look up at that statue of Caleb Greystone, up there on the mausoleum roof. What about it? Well, when we saw it on the other side of the hollow, it faced toward the road, didn't it? Why, yes. Now it's facing away from the road. And it did move, Hugo. It did move. More than that, Anne. While we lost sight of it down in that hollow, it turned completely around. strange phenomenon of the restless statue intrigued Hugo Carter at no end. Like a hound after his quarry, he scrambled to the roof of the mausoleum and made a thorough examination of both the statue and the roof in the moonlight. He reported his findings to Police Commissioner Williams, and the next morning, in the light of day, they revisited the scene. You two up there had better be careful. That roof's slippery. Oh, we'll be all right, Anne. Here, Commissioner. Watch what happens when I grasp this statue. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting, Hugo. It turns loosely on that upright bar. Yes, and I've no doubt that old Caleb Greystone is turning down below in his tomb at this sacrilege we're committing on his image. You know what, Commissioner? What? This statue isn't marble through and through. It's merely a marble surface on a light aluminum base. A man could lift it right off this support and walk off with it over his shoulder. Yes, yes, he could. But not that it proves anything. But these scratches on this polished stone roof, May, almost looks as though they led to the door of the crypt on the other end of the roof. It's hard to tell. I tried the door of the crypt last night. It was locked. Yeah, it's still locked. Hey, it's a massive tomb. Big enough to take care of 20 dead millionaires. Yes, you'd think old Caleb Greystone would be pretty lonely down there. And his condition would be lonely anywhere. Well, you go. Where do we go from here? Let's have a talk with the park superintendent, Commissioner. His office is over there on the left. Maybe he'll be able to throw a little light on the proceedings. As the old saying goes, you never can tell. Uh, Mr. Andrews, this is Hugo Carter at the criminologist. And his special assistant, Miss Smith. How do you Mr. do? Mr. Andrews, how do you do? Oh, yes, I've heard of you. How do you do? As superintendent of the Greystone Park, Mr. Andrews, we thought you might give us a little information on that tomb. Always glad to help the police, Commissioner Williams. Uh, thank you. Now then, uh, has that statue of Caleb Greystone always faced the road? Why, yes, as far as I know. It doesn't now, Mr. Andrews. You can see for yourself through the window. Why, bless my soul, you're right, Mr. Carter. Well, how do you suppose that happened? That's what we hope to find out. Interesting idea to build a statue of yourself and put it on your own mausoleum. Mr. Greystone had it made in memory of himself as a reminder to the public that he had converted his private estate into a park for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Somewhat of an egotist, huh? And from what the newspaper files say, eccentric. 
They practically accused old Caleb of dealing in black magic and selling his soul to the devil. Well, I understand the whole family was rather peculiar, Mr. Andrews. Well, yes, I suppose it's true. There were all sorts of rumors. Old Caleb was the eldest son, and he hated the rest of his family. Cheated them out of the family fortune, they say. It's said that he drove his own brother Arthur into poverty. Yes, yes, I remember the case. Arthur Greystone disappeared. Bureau of Missing Persons never did locate him. Mr. Andrews, that mausoleum out there is a pretty massive affair. Is old Caleb the only one buried there? Yes. As I said, he hated the rest of the family. He specified in his will that only he was to be buried there. That wasn't very hospitable of him. So old Caleb has that whole place all to himself, huh? What are you getting at, Hugo? Yes, that's what I'd like to know, too. Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. It's just that these cases of abnormal psychology interest me. Yes, Commissioner, they interest me no end. Come in. Oh, hello, Anne. Hello, Hugo. Relaxing at the piano, I see. Yes. Would you like me to stop? No, I like that melody you're playing. So do I. You know, music brings a certain clarity to the jumbled mind. It resolves things. It's a mental lullaby. Where have you been, Anne? Down at police headquarters. Poor Commissioner Williams. Why poor Commissioner Williams? Every newspaper in town is clamoring either for a solution to this Greystone Park mystery or a new police commissioner. Yes, I know. It's a pity. You know, Anne, Frank Williams is not only a gentleman, he's our friend. I think the time has come for us to try and crack this case. The time has come, all right, but how? Well, we've seen the outside of Caleb Greystone's tomb. It might be interesting to have a look at the inside. The inside? Yes. I've got an idea that's where our solution lies. But, but how are you going to get in? That door of the crypt on the roof is locked tight. <laughs> well, Anne, if I may boast a little, I have a certain skill with burglar tools. Yes, I know, but you can't go there in broad daylight and burglarize somebody's mausoleum. I don't propose to go there in broad daylight. You mean we're going tonight? I mean I'm going tonight. I'm taking you home right after dinner. Oh, no, you don't. You need someone to hold your flashlight. And besides, I'm just mad about mausoleums. Oh, it's a lovely evening. And outside of this storm, it's just as black as... <gasps> oh, look out, Anne. This stone roof is slippery. Careful now. And the door of the crypt is right over here. Now keep your flashlight trained right on this lock. But wait a minute. How did that happen? How did what happen? Why, the door of the crypt is unlocked. Unlocked? Yes. Somebody's been here ahead of us. Oh, dear. It's, it's awfully dark down there. What are we going to do now? We're going inside. But... There may be someone in there. Well, I'll find out. You wait out here. Oh, no, Hugo Carteret. I'm not going to stand out here alone. I'm going in with you. Have it your own way. We'll take this hammer with us. It may come in handy. Careful now. There are stairs leading down into the crypt. You stay close to me. Hugo, I'm practically hugging you to death right now. Oh, it's cold in here. Well, it's dry at any rate. It's dark as pitch. I can't see a thing. Here, Anne, you take the hammer. Let me have the flashlight. Now, let's have a look. Oh! What? Hugo, look. There are two men lying there on the floor. They, they must be... Yes. The two men who disappeared in Greystone Park. William Marsden and Joe Donetti. Are they? Yes, I'm afraid they are. Oh, poor devils. Nobody would think of looking for them in here. How... How were they killed? They've got deep red marks around their throats. Typical of some kind of strangling cord. Oh, it's horrible. Why were they brought here? Why would anybody want to do a thing like this? The motor van, like everything else in this tragic case, was abnormal. I'm beginning to see now why. Anne, listen. Footsteps. 
On the roof. Someone's up there. Yes. You stopped by the crypt door. Hugo, do you... Do you think it's the restless statue? Perhaps. I do know it's the killer. Annie's coming down the steps. Put out that flashlight and flatten yourself against the wall. <laughs> Good evening. Oh, come now. I know you're in here. I can see in the dark better than you think. I have eyes like a cat. I saw you coming through the trees. I left the crypt door open for you. You walked right in, you fools. You walked right in. Who... who are you? Why, my name is Arthur Greystone. This is the Greystone tomb. I live here with my friend. So you killed these two men? Yes, it was lonesome here. I wanted my brother Caleb over there in the casket to have company. He wanted to sleep alone in this big, beautiful mausoleum. It was so selfish of him, so selfish. But now he has two others to sleep with him. <laughs> and soon he'll have four. You took the statue of your brother off the supporting rod, didn't you, Arthur? It was light enough to carry. You hid it here in the tomb and posed as your brother's statue. In the dark, your victims couldn't see that the statue was alive. You dropped a cord around their necks as they passed below. <laughs> You're very clever, my friend. No, I wouldn't move if I were you. I have the strangling cord here in my hand, and I'm very good at using it. Why did you do all this? My brother Caleb cheated me in life. Drove me into poverty. Then he tried to cheat me even in death. He built this tomb and willed that only he would sleep here. This is your idea of revenge, filling his tomb with sleeping companions. Yes, I've waited years to get even. <laughs> Caleb wanted to be alone, but now he'll never be alone. He'll never be able to realize his dying wish. Well, this talk has been very pleasant. Yes, indeed, but now we must get to work. What do you... I'll take you first, young lady. Please don't try to resist. I assure you I'm very strong. And really, I don't want to make you suffer. Look out, Anne! Don't, don't, don't. Oh, I can't you blame me with your flashlight, uh, will you? No. You fool out! I, I kill you with my bare hands! Oh, yeah. I'm stronger than you, do you hear? I'm turning uh, around this way! Uh, oh, nice work, Anne. You handle a hammer like a carpenter. Oh, Hugo, I, I'm afraid I've killed him. No, no, you just stunned him, that's all, Anne. I'll tie him up in his own cord in a moment. But first, let's have a good look at him with this flashlight. Lift that white hood of his, will you, Anne? Hugo, it's Tom Farrell, the gardener. And so ended the case of the lonesome corpse and another chapter in the memoirs of Hugo Carteret. Arthur Greystone had disappeared, only to reappear close to his brother's mausoleum as Tom Farrell, the gardener, a convenient alias. And the city of New York breathed a certain relief when this murderer, obsessed and poisoned by his macabre idea of revenge, finally went to the chair. shadows and stillness 
Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory. In the haunting hour, Keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Owl's Head Lighthouse sits on top of a hill that is just south of Rockland, Maine. It's located at the southern tip of the Rockland Harbor. It sits 100 feet above the sea and is a mere 30 feet tall. Though the lighthouse and the keeper's house are property of the United States Coast Guard, the grounds are open to the public. The name Owl's Head comes from the two indentations in the headlands that look like owl's eyes. In the 1800s, the lime trade in Rockland had grown so much that it was necessary to put in a lighthouse for ships coming into the Rockland Harbor at night. In 1825, President John Quincy Adams authorized the Owl's Head Lighthouse. There was an argument between John Quincy Adams and Fifth Auditor Stephen Pleasanton as to who would become the first keeper of the lighthouse. Eventually, the President's candidate, Isaac Stearns, won. In December of 1850, five ships went aground at Penobscot Bay. One of the ships, a small schooner, broke free the cables that it was tied to. At the time, there were three people on board – Roger Elliott, first mate Richard B. Ingraham, and his fiancée, Lydia Dyeron. They could do nothing as the ship crashed into some rocks. Elliott was able to escape the ship, make it to shore, and eventually found Owl's Head Lighthouse. By the time the keeper found him, he was already half-frozen. Elliot eventually worked up the strength to tell the keeper of the two other people who were aboard the ship. The keeper rounded up twelve other men to look for the two. When they found the couple, they were enclosed in a block of ice and appeared to be dead, but the men did not want to take any chances. They brought the couple back to the lighthouse. They put them in a tub of water and began to chip away at the ice. Then they began to slowly raise the temperature of the water and they exercised the frozen people's muscles. Finally, they began to show signs of life, and after several months, they made a full recovery and had four children. Roger Elliott was not so fortunate to make a full recovery. In the 1930s, the keeper of the lighthouse was Augustus B. Hamer, who had a Springer Spaniel named Spot. As time went on, Spot learned to pull the rope that rang the fog bell when it became very foggy until it was his full-time job. One stormy night, the Matinicus mailboat almost ran aground at Owl's Head. 
The rope for the fog bell was too frozen for Spot to pull, so he began to bark. The captain of the vessel heard Spot barking and safely maneuvered away from the shore. After Spot had died, he was buried next to the fog bell. The ghost that is often spotted at Haunted Owl's Head Lighthouse resembles that of an old sea captain. He's often recognized by unexplained footprints in the snow, polished brass, and feelings of coldness. One three-year-old daughter of a keeper befriended the ghost. He helped her alert her parents one night when the fog was rolling in and that it was time to sound the foghorn. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. The Mamas in the Little Theater of the Air. while the hermit tells you the story. <laughs> this is a story of love that has no end, of the deep, dark shadows of sorrow, of dreams that span the bridge of time. It's my story and Loray's. I am David Runzo, just an ordinary guy with hopes like yours and dreams like yours. I was one in a foxhole with thousands of boys. And in the nighttime when the enemy was pouring all they had on us, I did what a lot of fellows did. I put my mind on other things, but not so my pal Jim Green. The giving is all we got tonight, Dave. Yeah. There was a funny feeling a guy gets out here. Never knowing just what minute the end is going to come, and yet, oh, it's so close, you can down near taste it. Yeah. It's a funny thing, though. It never seems to get you like it does me. You know why, Jim? <laughs> got some secret system? Maybe. Well, give. Let another guy in on it. You got a girl back home, Jim? <laughs> a girl. Man, I've got dozens. I've got just one. <laughs> I figure there's more safety in numbers. You've got just one. How do you know she'll be yours when you get back? I know, Jim. There was never anyone for Loray but me. And there was never anyone for me but Loray. You got more faith than I have, Dave. There's still a lot of fellas on the home front making hay while the sun shines. So they tell me. I never worry about Loray. She's always with me. Always. Yeah, I come... <laughs> Christopher, that was a close one. Yeah. I hate all of this. Why do we have to be out here? Our bodies targets for death. Quiet, Jim. Think about something else. You're a fool, Dave. You don't have any more chance than I have. But I have. I've got faith. You know what, Jim? It always seems that Loray is right beside me. Sometimes walking in front of me, shielding me from enemy fire. <laughs> That's rot. You don't have to believe me, but I know it's true. I can feel her presence tonight more than ever. 
I know she's here beside me. You expect me to believe in such a thing? As if a person a million miles away could protect you in this foxhole. What's more, it's getting hotter around here. We're in for it tonight. Faith, Jim. Faith. I'm afraid, Dave. Let LaRae protect you as she does me. Down no, this spot it is. We gotta move out of here. Jim, don't be a fool. It ain't safe here, I tell you. They're zeroed in on us. Jim, come back. Jim. Oh, Jim, I told you to stay by me. The ray would have protected you. Jim! Oh, you may not believe my story any more than Jim, who lost his life that night. But I knew my darling Loray was constantly by my side. No matter how terrible the battle, she was protecting me. When I was in the front line, she was my shield and my protector. When we moved along the roadways and our planes above spotted us, I had no fear. For Loray was near me. Since childhood, we'd been pals living on nearby farms. Somehow, even as kids, we seemed to sense that there was a strong bond between us that no amount of kidding from the other kids could harm. <laughs> They're all laughing because you're walking home with me, Dave. As if I care. They'll bother you all day tomorrow in school. Let them just try. Dave? Yeah? Are you planning to marry me when we grow up? Well, I guess I am. I'm planning to marry you, too. Can't nobody bother us. Only Pa. He says it's silly for a little girl to have a sweetheart. You are my sweetheart, aren't you, Dave? Well, I guess so. You're the only one I like in all the world. More than your uncle and aunt that you live with? Sure, they ain't like real folks to me. You are. I'll always belong to you, Dave. Always. <laughs> And that's the way it was, right up through the years. We always belonged together. Maybe it was because I didn't have any real folks. I was an orphan. And the folks that adopted me let me call them aunt and uncle. They were good to me. Uncle Henry planned to let me run the farm when I got through my course down at agricultural college. And someday, the farm would be mine. And Lorraine and I, we planned to be married just as soon as I finished my school course and began to run the farm. And then, along came the war, and I had to go. And the evening before I left, Loray and I walked to our favorite place for meeting, in the woods, just beyond the clearing of Uncle Henry's place. We had a favorite old log there where we could peer through the clearing and see the house and hills beyond. And a patch of sky to the west, where the sun dipped down from sight and sent colored streamers out into the sky. And here, when night came, we could look up above the treetops and see the stars and watch the old moon come riding forth into a purple field. Our trysting place was like a seat in a cathedral. Everything good and clean in life was close to us there at our meeting place in the woods. It was here that we said goodbye. You don't want me to come into town and go to the station, Dave? Don't you think it's better to say goodbye here? We'll never say goodbye, Dave. Never. No matter where you go, I'm always going to be with you. Sure. I kind of feel like that, too. And, Dave, when you come back, the very hour that you return to me, I'll know it. I won't come down to the station. I'll be waiting here in the woods, here on the old log. This is where you'll find me. Oh, Loray. Dave. You'll be brave? Yes. I'm going now. Don't turn and look. I'm walking away, but I'm not really leaving at all. I'll be with you always. Oh, don't turn and look. Before you know it, I'll be back. I'll return and be sitting beside you, here on the log at our old trysting place. And so it was that all during the long days of war, I never felt that I was really away from Loray at all, or that she was absent from me. Why, there were times when it was as if I could reach out just a little and find her beside me. 
In fact, there were times that I could actually hear her voice. I recall the first time I heard it. It was a bad hour. The enemy was giving us everything they had from the sky. Fellas I knew and liked were dropping all around me. Their cries struck terror in my heart. of all the hellfire and dying, the pain and the terror. Just as clear as a bird call on a silent night, I heard Lorraine's voice for the first time. Do not fear, my darling. I'm here, Dave. Here beside you. It was so clear, that voice of hers, that I expected to look and see her standing near me. You can scoff if you like. You can shrug your shoulders and pass my whole story over lightly if you wish. But I know Lorray was there beside me as the battle raged all around. And then it was over. The war was over. And finally the day came for leaving the battle-torn old world, getting on a ship and starting homeward. shouting and rejoicing. There was singing and laughter. There was hope about to be fulfilled. There was home just beyond the horizon. We were at sea. Then we were in the harbor. Then on shore. And then soon discharge. I'd made up my mind I'd return without a word to anyone. Yes, I'd fool Lorraine. She said she'd know the very hour that I'd be returning. I wouldn't have to tell her, she said. The very hour that you return to me. I'll know it. I won't come down to the station. I'll be waiting here in the woods. Here on the old log. This is where you'll find me. Yeah. We'd see how good she was. We'd test that second sight of hers, that intuition. All the while on the train that carried me towards home, I kept chuckling to myself. We'll see. Just see if she will be waiting on the old log when I come walking into the woods. My heart was pounding with the excitement of my returning, of the surprise in store for Lorray. Oh, it seemed as though the long train trip would never end. But finally, we pulled into the station. There was a little bunch of town folks around the old depot. I didn't want to see anybody. I waited until the train was almost ready to leave, and then I jumped off on the opposite side. I took to the fields that led out to the road to where our farm stood. It was autumn. Already there'd been a frost. And the old maples in the woods were dressed in scarlet, brilliant red. Under my feet, the dry leaves made soft music. Only a little way further to go, and our log would be in sight. And then, there it was before me. I stopped dead still. I couldn't move. For there she was. There was Lorraine, seated on the log just as she'd promised. The setting sun made her all golden. Her fair hair was touched with it, and sparks of light danced upon it. She was looking right at me. Now she was standing, her arms stretched out to me. Oh, Dave. Dave. Oh, you knew. Yes, Dave. You knew I was coming. Yes, my darling. Just as you said you would know. Yes. Oh, darling Lorraine, you've never been absent from me. Not for an instant. No, Dave. You followed me wherever I went. Yes. There were times when I actually heard your voice. Of course. What did you say to me? Do you remember what you said? Yes. Tell me. I remember. I said, do not fear, my darling. I'm here, Dave. Here beside you. Yes. That's what I heard you say. We will never be separated, Dave. Never. Of course we won't. Not now. I'm home safe and we'll never be parted again. Never let anyone tell you differently. Never let them say that we are parted. Oh. 
What do you mean? We're together. We can't be parted, not ever again. Dave. Oh, my darling. More beautiful than ever. But you're so cold. Night is coming. It's chilly here in the woods. I must get you home. <laughs> Try and catch me. Try and catch well, me, Dave. Well, hey, hey. You can't run away from me like this. Wait, I'll catch you. I'm a pretty fair runner these Try days. <laughs> Don't you know I've been in training? Hey, you can't hide from me. Well, what do you know? You've pulled one on me. I, I can't see you anywhere. Loray, where are you? Say, you can't run out on me like this. I'll find you. Huh. Well, what do you know? Got out of my sight. Okay, honey, you win. If you can hear me, I'm going up to the house to clean up a bit. See Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha. But I'll be over to your house on the stroke of seven. Do you hear me? At seven. And tomorrow we get the license to be married. Loray, can you hear me? The license to be married. grand feeling to see oh, you two. Oh, don't he look wonderful, Henry. Taller than ever and filled out, too. Oh, we're glad to have you back, David. Glad you made it safe and sound. Oh, I tell you, there wasn't a chance of me not making it. You know something, Aunt Martha? All through the terrible business, I felt that Loray was beside me, protecting me from death. Oh, Davy. And the most wonderful part about it all, even though I never let any of you know I was coming home today, Loray had a feeling about it. She was waiting in the woods for me just now at our old log where we always used to meet. What did you say, Dave? Loray was waiting in the woods for me. I just left her. She sensed that I was coming home today, and just like we planned before I went away, she was waiting for me in the woods. My boy. Henry. Henry, you got her. Didn't you get our letters, Dave? Well, sure, I got some, but mail hasn't caught up with me now for a long time. Dave. Oh, Dave. What's wrong? <gasps> What is it? Well, David, it's like this. She couldn't have met you in the woods, David. Loray couldn't have been in the woods just now. But she was. I just saw her. No, David, no. Loray died, my boy. She passed away just a little while after you went overseas. We wrote you. We finally wrote you about her death. David finds that the person close to his heart, who he has just met at the old trysting place in the woods, is of this world no more. She's a dream and a vision that is ended in death. What will happen to David's life now? Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> now the hermit again. Now, David Runzo goes on relating the story of his life to the hermit. Listen. <laughs> you ask, what happens to my life now? You think that I believe that death has separated Loray and me? Never. As we reckon time on this earth, my Loray was asleep in death at the time she appeared to me on the battlefield. She was not of this world when, in returning home, I met her in the woods at our old and destined meeting place. Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha have taken a place in town. They've left me the farm as they promised, and I'm working it. I've been here three months now. Last evening, Aunt Martha came out to see me. I... Brought you a pie and some cookies, David. Thanks, Aunt Martha. Oh, your Uncle Henry and I worry about you, my boy. Oh, you must not do that. But we can't have you here all alone. I'm not alone. David, 
You need somebody to keep house for you. You should find a nice girl, court her, and, and marry Aunt her. Aunt Martha, never. Oh, it ain't right. It's a sinful, terrible thing, you thinking that a dead girl is beside you all the time. Oh, stop, Aunt Martha. You can't talk this way to me. I got her, David. The living can't bow down to the dead. Loray is not dead. I saw her lowered into her grave. You must say no more. It's the way I want it. There's no one in all the world, here on this earth or after, that I want but Loray. Oh, David. It's the war. It's touched your mind. No, Aunt Martha. There's no use trying to explain. There's a bond between Loray and me that is stronger than life, deeper than earth, and beyond all time and reckoning. Sometimes I wonder. I puzzle over the why of it all. Why am I left on earth alone? Why, if Loray had to pass beyond, I could not have met her there. But such was not the way it was planned. And I'm not alone. Often as night gathers, when the stars light the sky, when the wind is soft and blows a fragrance in the windows, I hear the door open softly. Loray? Yes, David. I am here. I can feel your presence, but I cannot see you. I cannot always return to your sight, but I am ever present. Yes, I know. I will always be near you. Oh, why can't I too die that we may be together? That I cannot answer. There will be an hour, a time for meeting. You will never appear to me again like you did in the woods when I came home? No, my darling. Not until the final hour. Until my death, you mean? We do not call it death. We who love, for love is stronger than death, my darling. Love is of the spirit, and the spirit never dies. And so it is I know. The love I bear for Loray and the love she bears for me knows no boundary, nor no ending. Do you scoff? Do you shake your head in disbelief? Do you believe, as does Aunt Martha, that my mind is addled by the horrors of war? Do you believe it untrue that my Loray, because of death, hath left me? Uh, what matter what you say or what you think? I tell you, she is with me always. During the soft early hours of dawn, when the sun rides the summit, when dusk falls and the shadows lengthen to bring the night, when the wind sings, when the pines mourn, she is near me. This is my story of love that never ends. David Rudzo, a boy who believes in a love stronger than life or death. This is a story he told me, a story without end. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, and occurrences is purely accidental.
If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. A creature, part of the darkness before God created the heavens and earth, has awakened. It had slumbered, hibernating from the light. Now it's hungry and wanting to feed. Bobby, a local kid, and the police chief have gone missing. Everyone in the small town of Standard, Illinois, is turning to former Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find them. But as he starts his search, more people disappear. Rob is quickly overwhelmed. The night itself seems to come alive, taking these people. Aletto must find out why and discover a way to stop it before the entire town slips into darkness. Into Darkness by Jason R. Davis Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar, the greatly anticipated sequel to Inside the Mirrors. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Tybee Lighthouse was first built in 1736. However, several violent storms and shore erosion caused this Georgia lighthouse to become structurally unsound. As a result, the lighthouse was meticulously rebuilt. Over the years, inclement weather and erosion did away with the light a couple more times, and the lighthouse that stands today is actually the fourth one on Tybee Island. Many people who visit this scary lighthouse have reported hearing disembodied sounds, such as phantom whistling and the sound of unseen feet. A few people have even reported seeing the apparition of a five-year-old while climbing the stairwell. The ghost girl, who wears historic clothing, warns visitors not to go any further up the staircase. Some paranormal enthusiasts have theorized that the girl may have perished when one of the previous Tybee lighthouses crumbled to the ground in a storm. More of the world's most haunted lighthouses coming up when Weird Darkness returns. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Mystery Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House.
Well, hi, Barbie. The story we're trying out for Mystery House tonight deals with freaks, you said. Uh, circus, shide show people? <laughs> That's right, Dan. And they're unlike any people you've ever known. Completely unreal from our way of looking at things. And yet, such people actually exist. Hmm, sounds like it ought to be a dandy. Sideshow atmosphere, barkers, all that sort of thing. You know, Mr. Glenn, the sideshow barker was a forerunner of the radio announcer. Uh Uh-oh, I feel that remark's leading up to something, Tom. (laughs) As a matter of fact, it is. It's leading up to a message from our sponsor. Okay, Tom, set the scene. Malice in Wonderland. That's right, folks. I said Wonderland. The great Wonderland circus sideshow with the most gargantuan collection of freaks, monstrosities, and curiosities ever assembled under canvas. Nelly, the bearded lady. Jolly Dello, who tips the scales at 500 and breaks them at 550. Joe Seffi, the greatest sword swallower in the world. Enigmo, the living zombie. Moke and Pope, the jungle monstrosities. And Professor Flash, the greatest magician the world has ever known. For this one performance only, see them all. Don't crowd, don't push. The ticket line foams at the right. This outfit's jinxed if ever I saw them it was. Why, I ain't gonna be a fat lady no longer if we don't start hitting some business. Wonderland. The wonder is how Flash manages to keep us going. I'm weighing myself half to death wondering when we're going to close. Well, you haven't lost any weight, Della. You look real good. Well, thanks, Millie. It's that midget, Major Tumble. He's a jinx. We've had nothing but trouble since he joined the show. Oh, there's Enigma. He wants a drink of water. Oh, I'll get it for him. You suppose that's a racket? Or can't Enigma move a muscle except the little finger of his left hand? Well, if it is a racket, Millie, it's a tough one. Imagine being sprawled out on a cot that, that way all your life and not being able to say anything or do anything. Just ring a little bell with the little finger of your left hand. Oh, I'll be right back. Oh, hello, Joseph. Hello. Bah, four picture postcards of myself I sold the last show. Me, the great Giuseppe, the world's finest sword swallowed. Forty cents. It's that Major Timble. Major Timble is too big in the brain for the rest of his body. <laughs> Someday I run a sword right down his mouth to the tip of his toes. He sure got my sore saying her beard was a fake. And what did he tell me? That my swords are fake. Me, the great Giuseppe. You know, I've seen sideshow people get sucker sore, sick of having people stare at them. But it ain't just the toners Major Timble hates. He don't seem to like nobody. Oh, there you are, Giuseppe. Oh, Hello. Been looking all over for you. It's time to start the ballet for the next show, Giuseppe. I am not doing the ballet. What? I said, I am not doing the ballet. Look, Giuseppe, you ain't an opera star. How do you think we get the customers in here? You're doing the ballet who all right and right now. No. Ah, leave him alone, Flash. She's down in the mouth. Well, that's the way a sword swallower ought to be, ain't it? Down in the mouth. Get it? <laughs> You're a riot, Flash. Yeah, okay, okay. Come on, snap out of it, Giuseppe. We got to stir up a tip, get a crowd. Flash, Flash, you got to do something about that midget. This can't go on any longer. Now, oh, calm yourself, Millie. What's wrong now? I don't mind him saying my beard's a fake because it isn't, and I can prove it. Josephie and Della can take care of themselves, too. But when he starts picking on Enigma... Oh, you're crazy. He ain't done nothing to Enigma. Enigma rang his bell a couple of minutes ago. Della heard it, too. Four rings for a glass of water. I took it to him, and there was Major Tembo pinching him to see if he could get any muscular reaction. Pinching him real hard. And poor Enigma not able to do a thing about it. Well, I guess it don't hurt Enigma any. He can't feel anything. Well, it's the idea. You've got to get rid of Major Tembo. Look, I'm running Wonderland, and Major Tembo's a good crowd pleaser. Crowd pleaser? What crowd? Look, Giuseppe, I'm trying to be nice. Now, I've been taking it on the chin, and I've been paying off in spite of it. Paying off? You think the nickels and dimes you toss at us is paying off? I can make more money digging ditches. Yeah? Well, that's what you'll be doing if you don't come out of the tent with me and do the ballyhoo act. Let Major Tambo do the ballet. No. Once the towners see him, they won't pay their dough to come inside and look at him. Like with Della, same thing. I tell them she weighs 550 pounds. That they could see, they wouldn't shell out their dough. Oh, no. You don't put your freaks on the ballet. You and me, we got to do it. Major Tambo can do it. Me? I am not. Yeah, I never see such a bunch of squirrels. Why I got into this racket, I don't know. Nursing a bunch of slug nutty freaks. I am not a freak. My talent has amazed the greatest scientists of the yeah, continent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Store it, store it. That midget. He insults us. He pushes everybody around. 
Let him do the valley. I ought to fire you, Josephi. Now get out on that valley platform before I bust you one. You better, Josephi. Lice is mad. What's the matter, Josephi? You jealous of Tembo? Me? Jealous of that little peanut? Jealous of that wart on the finger of humanity? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Okay. I'll just use Major Tembo. I'll put him on the valley and show you how a real freak can draw a crowd. I'll show you what a bum you are. You think you make me cry? He's what I suggest all the time. Where is he? I do not keep track of him. The further away from me he is, the better I like. That's where he'll be. With Moke and Pook. He's got him fighting again. He teases him. Come on. I'll show him whether he can or not. A little punk. Come on. <laughs> That's right, Moke. Hit him in the face. Don't let him get away with it, Pook. Scratch his eyes out. Go ahead, Moke. Hey, you. You. Hi, Flash. Look, I ought to fold you up and put you in my hip pocket, you little rat. Aren't you kind of forgetting yourself, Flash? You want them two idiots to kill each other? I was just enjoying myself, Flash. Some people have fun one way, some another. I... Look, you're doing the ballet with me. Now, come on. Yeah, I know. I heard all about it. You were eavesdropping on us, listening to what we said. None of you ever said anything worth listening to. Some gall you got, spying on us and not even taking the trouble to deny it. You think I care what you halfwits think of me? Listen, Major, you ought to try to get along with the rest of the freaks. Rest of the freaks? You mean to say you include me in this assortment of malformed monstrosities? Oh, sure. You ain't a freak. Not much. You're a normal-sized guy, you are. My dear tub of lard. Say. I am a perfectly, perfectly formed individual, which is more than you can say. Furthermore, valuable things come in small packages. Yeah, you're a package, all right. You, you, you wart? Wart, am I? How would you like to go back to the Van Arnhem show, Josephi? <laughs> Sit down, Della. How are you? Sit down. Well, I'm afraid of your chairs, Giuseppe. Major Timbo's quite a boy, ain't he? Me? I will break his little neck myself. You know, Giuseppe, I keep a file of old billboard magazines. I got to wondering what the Major meant about you going back to the Van Arnhem show. Ah, uh, that... T- the story about a sword swallower on the Van Arnhem show, Giuseppe, from two years ago. I... I know nothing about This sword swallower got into an argument with the boss, and he sort of used one of his swords on him. Then he let out. I know nothing about The guy's name was Enright. Joe Enright. I do not know him. Kind of funny. Joseph Enright. Joseph E. Josephi. I'd hate to think I was on a show with a murderer. If the little walking poison does not quit making such remarks, You will be, Della. You. What are you doing here? Get on my tent, you little runt. You only scared me to death. Don't talk in such a raspy voice, Millie. You don't sound like yourself. I'm myself, all right. And I've taken about enough from you. I just came in for a little visit, Millie. I'm not interested in visiting with you. You're not like the rest of these people, Millie. You're no freak. You're an educated woman. You talk correctly. If you think you're going to flatter me... You're intelligent. And that beard of yours is real, Millie. You actually grew it. Quite a time getting a beard like that, I bet. Of course, I know people in the business who'll get a beard started for any woman who wants to be a bearded lady in the sideshow. What of it? Some down and outer without any education. I can understand a person like that going for your kind of a racket, Millie. But you're different. Get out of here. It bothered me for quite a while, Millie. And I finally tumbled. Tumbled to what? Who are you hiding from, Millie? Why did you run away? Who are you afraid is going to find out who you are? Get out of here before I kill you, you little... You're hiding your face for a reason, Millie. That beard's a disguise... Maybe you're right, Major. Right? Of course I'm right. If you are, you're not being very smart, are you? Aren't you likely to get into an awful lot of trouble? You wouldn't dare do anything to me. You wouldn't dare because you're hiding from something. You'll do as I say from now on, Millie, because I've caught you. (laughs) 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I show you I have nothing in my hands and nothing up my sleeve. And now I present one of the greatest magic illusions of all time, the dollhouse illusion. Here you are, ladies and gentlemen. You see the doll's house, a miniature house hardly big enough to hold a large doll. I turn it so you can see it from all sides. Absolutely no trap doors, no concealed spaces. Now I open the front of the doll's house to show you it's absolutely empty. You see... It's a... Wait a minute. What's going on here? Giuseppe, quick. Come here. Help me. Something wrong? Look, it's Major Temple, all folded up in the dollhouse with a knife to his heart. He's been murdered. Oh. Look, look. Enigma's been right here, right on the platform next to yours. And it's a sense he hasn't been away. He'll know who killed Major Temple. He saw the murder. He had to see it. Yeah, that's right. Enigma. Hey, listen. Enigma. Enigma. Did you know Major Temple had been murdered? Once. That means yes. Did you see Major Temple kill? So, whoever killed Major Temple forget all about the Enigma. He sees the whole thing. He knows. Yeah, maybe he knows. Enigma, do you know who killed Major Temple? Two times. No. He doesn't know who did it. But if he saw the murder... Maybe it was done by somebody who is skilled at deception. A magician. Look, Josephe, somebody like you. Who did kill the midget Major Tembo? And why can't Enigmo tell who did it? Why didn't he see the murderer when he saw the murder? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. Meanwhile, here's a brief message from our sponsor. And now, act two of Malice in Wonderland. We go back to the tent that houses the Wonderland Circus Sideshow. The midget's body is still in the dollhouse awaiting the arrival of the coroner. Look at him with that sneer on his face, like he was still hating us. Well, I guess he must have had a reason to hate somebody, Della. Well, I ain't sorry he's dead. He was a mean little troublemaker. Oh, you ain't sorry he's dead, huh? Well, I am. There is nothing to be sorry about. No? You'll change your mind when the hick cops show up. They can't do nothing to me. I was not even near. That's just the point, Giuseppe. Whether or not you killed Major Tembo don't make any difference. The little punk's got us all in hot water up to our necks. I don't know how you figure that, Flash. Look, Della, I wasn't born yesterday. The midget had something on every one of you. Just like he had on me. Uh, On you? Yeah, on me. Why do you think I hired the little rat? Why do you think I didn't kick him in the teeth the first day he was around here? Because I was afraid of him, that's why. Then you had a motive? Cut it out. We all had motives. We all got something to hide from the cops. When they start digging into this business, we're all going to be in trouble. Bad trouble. Well, I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, you ain't. You're staying right here. There's only one thing for us to do, and we've got to work fast. What's that? We've got to find out who the murderer was before the cops get here. We've got to turn the killer over to them before they start prying into our business. Enigma. He knows who the murderer is. He says he didn't know. Well, he can tell us. He saw it. You do not even know if Enigma has a mind. You know nothing of him but the tinker of a bell. Well, it won't hurt to try. Enigma. Did any one of us put Major Tembo into that dollhouse? Well, that's something. We know it wasn't one of us who killed him. Well, then... Just a minute. Did anybody put Major Tembo into the dollhouse? He says no. You see me? That won't work. Major Tembo hid in the dollhouse himself. He was hiding there to spy on us. All doubled up like he had to be, he could not protect himself. And somebody killed him. Did you see who it was, Enigma? Was Flash near the dollhouse after Major Tembo hitting it? Yes. Enigma says Flash was there. Wait a minute. Was Giuseppe near the dollhouse, Enigma? He lies. I was And Major not... Tembo had a knife in his heart. You're kind of an expert with knives, Giuseppe. He's done some work of that kind before. On the Van Arnold I would so keep he... my mouth shut if I were you, Della. Listen, Enigma. Was Della near the dollhouse? Hey, well, I guess I'm the only one who wasn't near it then. So I'll kind of take charge of things. <gasps> Was Millie near the dollhouse, Enigma? <laughs> you see, he tells us nothing. I w- say, do you suppose Enigma's a fake? 
Maybe Major Tembo knew he was a phony. You can forget that, Della. Enigmo ain't no phony. He had accident and health insurance. The insurance company really gave him the works. Accident and health insurance? Yeah. Then what's he doing this for? If he's got dough, why ain't he in a hospital where he belongs? I... Okay. That's what Major Tembo had on me. The show's been losing money all season. That's where I've been getting the dough. Cashing Enigmo's insurance checks. I found him when that paralysis was just starting. I kind of took charge of him. Major Tembo got into my stuff and found out about it. So, you are a very noble man, yes? Preying on a helpless individual. Well, you ain't so hot yourself. I never killed anybody anyway. Ain't you getting into this true confession session, Millie? You shut your fat mouth. You think Major Tembo did not know about you, Della? What are you talking about? He was just holding back. He was busy with the rest of us. You were on his list. You're lying. He didn't know... Didn't know what, Della? Nothing. Hey, hey look. Moak and Polk's cage. It's empty. It's unlocked. I'll bet that's some more of Major Tembo's work. He let them out and they killed him. What? Those two idiots? Why, they wouldn't be able to figure out how to open the dollhouse. But we gotta find them. Why? These stupid imbeciles are not worth hunting for. They are They not... could get us into a lot of trouble. You are already in trouble, Flash. Yeah. Well, we gotta get Enigma out of here before the cops start asking too many questions. Come on, Giuseppe. Give me a hand. We'll carry his cot back to my trailer. Not me, Flash. If you want him out of here, go ahead and do it yourself. You mean to say... You... I am not looking for a tangle with the law. Me? I think I will be a bystander. Oh, so you think you're going to frame me into getting a rap for the midget's murder, huh? Well, think again. I'll tell the cops all about you. You and the Van Arnhem show and the guy that got killed. Stop it! I'm... You fools aren't careful. We'll all be in jail. Start trying to get even with each other and we'll all be in trouble. We've got to stick together. Stick together? <laughs> You think I would trust any one of you? No, I think not. We waste time. We should all be heading for distant places. Come back here, you. Flash! Where'd you get that gun? Never mind that. Come back, Giuseppe. You ain't leaving me to take the rap. Not on murder. No? Flash, I do not think you have the nerve to shoot. I'll show you whether I... <laughs> Millie, you hit my wrist. Oh, you fool. Now we are in for it. That shot will bring the cops swarming all over us. You made me miss him. You can thank me for keeping you from committing a murder. You idiot. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh-oh, here we go. That looks like police coming in the front entrance of the tent. I, I don't like the idea of their questioning us this one at a time. I I I'd like to hear what's said. Oh, you nervous, Della? All they asked me was routine stuff. What I found, you know... Giuseppe's been with him quite a while, though. And I don't trust him. Shh, here he comes now. Oh, hello, Giuseppe. So, you thought you were very smart, Flash, telling the police about me. I didn't tell him anything. Who do you think you fool, eh? Well, they know a lot more now about you and Enigma. Why, you dirty little... Flash, please. I tell them about your gun, too. How you tried to kill me. I wasn't trying to kill you. I just didn't want you to run out. You rotten screw. Stop on. it! Who's next, Giuseppe? They asked to talk to Della next. Okay. Wish me luck, everybody. Yeah. Suppose she'll spill everything she knows, too. <laughs> she will be pretty busy defending herself. What I said about telling the police about you, that was all a bluff. What? You mean you didn't tell them anything? Not about you. I threw all the suspicion on Della. I did not want her to know. But there wasn't anything you could say about Della. No? I told them how she hated Major Tembo. How he knew something about her that had her scared. And I told them how Della borrowed one of my knives yesterday. The same knife we find in Major Tembo's heart. So you think you're putting me on a spot, do you, Giuseppe? I simply tell the police the truth. Why, you dirty lying rat. Tell them I borrowed one of your knives. Don't you remember that, Della? You know darn well I don't remember it. I didn't do it. But you needn't think you're so smart. No? No. I told them all about the Van Arnhem show and the guy who got stabbed. I really told them. They got some long-distance telephone calls in now. Why, you devil, you... Well, what did you think i do? Take your lies without fighting back? I got to get out of here. Uh, uh, Josephie, if you're facing the murder rap anyway, looks like you're kind of elected to take this one. I know nothing about this. The other, it was self-defense. I can prove it. I had to kill that one. Why did you run away then? He had friends. Very bad friends. It was from them, not the law I run. I bet you killed Major Tembo, too. 
And wouldn't you have fun telling anybody you killed him in self-defense? Yeah. Giuseppe might have killed Tembo at that. Enigma says no. Uh, Enigma says no to everything. He says he saw the murder. Says we was all there at one time or another. Says he saw Major Tembo go into the Dow House. And then he says he don't know who stabbed him. Maybe he's holding something back. He say yes. He is holding something back. You fools. Don't you get it? What are you talking about, Della? Enigma knows who the murderer is. He's known all along. Well, then why did... He didn't want either us or the cops to know. Not too soon. You, you mean he did it himself? But that's impossible. Of course it's impossible. He didn't want anybody to know who the murderer was because if the murderer was caught, that's all there'd be to it. The killer'd be turned over to the police and that'd be that. You got something, Della. Enigma says yes again. Of course he says yes. Enigma wanted every one of us questioned. He wanted all of us put in a tight place where we talked. He figured sooner or later, the cops would get the story of what Flash has been doing to him. The way Flash has been robbing him. Listen, if you think I'm going to let that zombie frame me for this murder... There's no point to his framing you for murder. All he wants is to get out from under your control. I, I, I didn't kill the midget. I had nothing to do Just with it. Just a minute. I... Enigma. Did Flash kill Major Tembo? You see? He says no. I don't know nothing about it anyway. Enigma, if I promise to tell the cops all about Flash and what he's been doing to you, will you tell us who the murderer is? No, I know you don't. Not yet, Della. You ain't turning me over to the coppers. Enigma, I promise to tell the cops. I'll tell them all about the way Flash has been cheating you. It's a deal. Why, you dirty... I ain't afraid of you, Flash. Put that gun back in your pocket. You don't dare shoot. Not with everybody else looking for somebody to pin a murder onto. I'll tell the cops, Enigma. It's a deal. Nobody's going to frame me on the testimony of a zombie who can't even talk. Enigma, was it me who stabbed Major Tembo? <laughs> Surprise. You make a deal with him, so he says it wasn't you. Was it Flash? Of course it wasn't me. Was it Millie, Enigma? Millie? No. Millie. No, I didn't do it. Shut up. Stop ringing that bell. I should have killed you, too. It didn't seem real to me. Couldn't talk, couldn't move. Didn't think you could hurt me. I should have killed you. Keep away from me, Millie. Looks like the rest of us kind of need Enigma. Don't you point that gun at me. I had to kill Major Temple. Flash on, honest, I did. I... He found out about me. Found out what? I killed somebody, too, back five years ago. And it wasn't self-defense. I killed a man because I hated him. Nobody should have known, but something went wrong and I had to run away. I was a fugitive hiding from my past. I figured out a perfect way to hide. A bearded lady in a circus sideshow. Who'd ever think of looking for a beautiful girl masqueraded as a bearded lady? Nobody but Major Tembo. And I'm glad I killed him. I I got even with him. Yeah, maybe so. But from where I stand, it looks like he kind of got even with the rest of us. The cops are going to have a busy day. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com.
made operational in 1875, the Currituck Beach Lighthouse first illuminated the northern shores of the Outer Banks in Corolla, North Carolina. Left unpainted with exposed brick, the powerful light immediately began saving lives as it guided ships safely around shallow waters with its unique light pattern. The two-story quaint Victorian home found on the grounds was first erected in 1876 as the Keeper's House and was used until 1939 when the light was automated. Originally, three keepers and their families lived on the grounds, sharing this residence. Eventually, the building would fall into disrepair until it was restored anew beginning in 1980. It is within this house that people claim the hauntings still occur. Is it the ghost of a former keeper or family member who once lived here? The North Bedroom seems to be the epicenter of ghost activity. Some people believe the ghost to possibly be young Sadie Johnson, a child of the first lightkeeper who tragically drowned while playing too near the water by herself. It was, of course, her bedroom on the north side, but perhaps she is not the spirit in question, but a victim of whatever haunts this room. The north bedroom was also the place where a friend of the family came to stay, possibly permanently, it would seem. She took ill and passed away in this very room. Might she haunt the lighthouse property? And if that were not enough reason to believe in ghosts at the Currituck Light, the final family that resided in the Keeper's house before it was closed in the 1930s, well before its restoration 50 years later, is said to also have had misfortune occur while living there. The wife of the last Keeper died of tuberculosis in the North Bedroom, so it is said. There is legend that workers who renovated the old building were afraid to step into the North Bedroom for some unknown reason. It's believed that the knowledge of its former tragedies was hidden from them, so what made them afraid? Could the untimely deaths woven into the history of the lighthouse in Corolla be just coincidence? Maybe, but this is the lore that haunts the Currituck Light. And tales about such ghosts have possibly spooked those who've had the opportunity to visit the North Room in recent times. It's not currently open for tours as it is used today as the groundskeeper and lightkeeper residence. When visiting the site in 2014, one group were told that the workers were not permitted to talk about the ghosts that may haunt the lighthouse, and the tourism was brisk. Who would want to risk frightening visitors away, after all? They did get one gentleman who worked there to confirm the haunting of the home, but he was of the opinion that the lighthouse was also haunted by the ghost, or ghosts, of those who once kept the light lit for ships at night. The Presque Isle Lighthouse, the old one that is, was built in 1840 on Lake Huron, Michigan. It was quickly taken out of service by 1870 due to a newer, taller lighthouse being built. Thus, the former was abandoned. Of historical importance, a family known as the Stebbins lovingly restored the lighthouse and keeper's dwelling as use for a summer home in the early 1900s. The Stebbins eventually opened the old Presque Isle Lighthouse to visitors and later on left it to tourism. Eventually, George and Lorraine Paris moved in to the keeper's dwelling to take care of it and show tourists the old lighthouse and grounds. George loved children and truly enjoyed showing the Presque Isle light to their visitors, but he noticed some strange happenings at this place. The amber light would sometimes be seen lit in the lighthouse tower, yet there would never be anyone there. In fact, the U.S. Coast Guard removed the wiring in 1979 to prevent this from happening further, and it did cease, but only for a while. George eventually passed away, but his wife Lorraine knew he was still residing there, because every day George used to make them breakfast before he passed, and she would awaken often to the smell of bacon and eggs after his death. The amber light began to be seen as well in the tower of the haunted lighthouse after his passing, and it was observed not only by Lorraine, but by the Coast Guard while on the water and by the National Guard when in the air. What further cemented the idea of the ghost being George who haunted the lighthouse was when a young girl climbed up the tower and returned, giggling with glee. She informed her parents that an older man had spoken to her and entertained her while she was up in the tower. Later, she was able to identify him as George Paris 
after seeing his portrait. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast present I Love a Mystery. I Love a Mystery. Presenting the latest adventures of the three comrades, Jack, Doc, and Reggie, now engaged in launching the A-1 Detective Agency just around the corner off Hollywood Boulevard and one flight up. Say, listen, Dresser, I know it's your job to get people to drink Fleischmann's yeast, and I know it's good for them if they need more vitamin B complex. But that's just the point. Why all this hullabaloo about vitamins anyway? Our ancestors seem to have gotten along pretty well without vitamins. Well, that's where you're wrong, Dick. Our ancestors got their vitamins from the food they ate. Well, why can't we? We do, but our modern methods of preserving, refining, and cooking foods are likely to result in the loss of certain priceless vitamins. So it becomes advisable to fortify our diet with some vitamins, especially the important vitamin B complex. And since it's known that the natural vitamin B complex is definitely unattainable in any mixture of the synthetic factors now known, you'll find many people drinking Fleischmann yeast. You see, you get the entire natural vitamin B complex in yeast. Well, that makes sense. But how does yeast taste? Well, people tell us that when you mix Fleischmann yeast in cool milk, water, or tomato juice, that it tastes just like oven-fresh bread. But here, see for yourself. Fleischmann's fresh yeast in tomato juice. Drink it, America! your help. Eight Kinds of Murder, a new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. o'clock in the afternoon in the super colossal old stone pile of a mansion, wherein the ancient and filthy rich A.B. Cooper Mitchell resides with his newest and most voluptuous wife, the fan dancer, Nevada Cole. Jack, Doc, and Reggie have just arrived at the Cooper Mitchell mansion for a last word with the septuagenarian multimillionaire before an all-out attempt to capture Mr. Purdy in his a dilapidated old apartment house out near the beach. Mr. Purdy warned that anyone approaching the ramshackle apartment house would be blasted into oblivion via the sawed-off shotgun road. But Jack, Doc, and Reggie have determined to chance it, as Mr. Purdy is a killer and his next declared victim is Nevada Cole. You see, Mr. Purdy is actually the son of Cooper Mitchell by an earlier marriage to a circus tightrope performer. 
Mitchell has not even heard of this son or his acrobatic mother since the child was eight months old. And now he comes back a man and a ruthless killer to do away with everyone who stands between himself and his father's millions. Already he has killed Doug Loftus and Judy White and Ava Blue and Satin Mitchell, each one dead by one of the methods named on his list of eight kinds of murder. And now Nevada Cole is next. That's why Jack insisted on stopping at the Mitchell residence to warn Nevada once more to remain locked indoors. That's what he's telling old A.B. Above everything else, Mr. Mitchell, keep Nevada safely locked in this house until we got Purdy behind bars. That's easier said than done, Mr. Packard. What do you mean by that? And Nevada Cole has a mind of her own, I'm afraid. Well, hasn't the little fool sense enough to know when she's in danger? Impetuous, Mr. Packard, impetuous. Uh, where is she now? Uh, in her suite in the West Wing, I should imagine. I know where it is, Jack. Okay, Reggie, go get her. Hey, uh, how about me going? No. Okay, okay. Go along, Reggie. You're quite. Uh, she won't appreciate the interruption, I'm afraid. Interruption? Uh, yes, this is the hour she spends before her great mirrors practicing her fan dance. Practicing her fan dancing in front of a looking light? <laughs> yes, I've seen her. Just let me go help, Reggie. Doc, will you relax? Relax with little old Nevada Cole doing a fan dance this very minute, maybe less than a hundred feet from where I'm standing yes, at? Yes, relax. On you asking for more than human flesh can stand. Look, if we can get off the subject of Nevada Cole and our fans for a minute, we... Hey, Don, where's that boy Huey? Huh? Well, he come in with us. He was here just a minute ago. Didn't I tell you not to let him out of your sight? Oh, he's probably just wandering around somewhere. Didn't I tell you the boy was in danger? Danger? Yes, danger. Why do you think we've been keeping him right with us since his mother was killed? Hey, I, I didn't think it was that serious. Well, it is. Nonsense. What danger could the lad be in in this house? Plenty. Somebody mentioned my name? Hey, Huey. Hey, Hugh. Where have you been? Oh, just out around the halls. Well, you ain't supposed to do that, fella. No? Why not? Look, you saw your mother murdered with your own eyes. Yes. You saw her fall four stories almost at your feet. What are you trying to do? Drive me crazy. I'm trying to drive some sense into your head. If Purdy felt it was necessary to kill your mother, he'll want to kill you for the same reason. I'm not afraid of Mr. Purdy. Oh, don't be such a blasted little fool. Well, I'm not. Yeah, it was only last night you come sobbing into the A-1 agency begging us to save you from Mr. Purdy. Well, he's not in this house, is he? We don't know whether he is or not. Jack, you mean that maybe he you, is? What are you saying, man? Mr. Purdy in this house? Why not? There's some kind of evil loose in this place. Evil? Evil? Yes, evil. Let me stop here to warn Nevada on our way to Purdy's Beach Place. Maybe we'll... Hey, Jack, what you talking about, sir? You've been here as long as I am. Yeah, but nothing... You have to wait. Wait for what? I imagine Huey here or Mr. Mitchell could tell you. How about it, Huey? I... I don't know what you're talking about. You don't, huh? No. You brought me here, didn't you? I just arrived when you did, didn't I? What can I know about what's going on in this house? You managed to give us the slip for a few minutes, didn't you? I wasn't trying to give you the slip. No. No. I just wasn't interested in your conversation, so I wandered out in the hall. Uh, maybe. What about you, Mitchell? Hey, what's that? I said, what about you? What about me? There's murder in this house. Murder. It's written as plain as day everywhere. Murder. I have been guilty of no murder in this house or any place else. Well, it's here. I don't believe you. Well, then you're just crazy in the head. Jack smells murder like most folks smell roses. If Jack says yeah. it is... Jack, look what I have here. Hey, here come Reggie. He's got Nevada. He's carrying Nevada coal. Hey, Reggie, what's the matter? Here, let me put her down. Nevada, Nevada. Well, is she dead, son? No, no, not yet. But examine her, Jack. Hurry. She may have been bitten by a snake. Snake? Here, yeah, let me see. Doc... Go get my kit out of the car. That black bag? Yeah, hurry. You bet you. Nevada, not you too. Makes you think she was bitten by a snake, Reggie. Well, I went to her suite and rapped on the door. There wasn't any answer. I tried the door and it was unlocked, so I opened it. Uh, oh, you found something? She has been bitten? Go on, go on. You opened the door. Right. There she was lying in a heap on the floor beneath her ostrich fans. Nevada. You'd better sit down, Nevada. Mr. Mitchell. Yes, Reggie. Well, I, I rushed over and lifted the fans and... There was a snake. What? Quite. A snake coiled on her abdomen. A snake was coiled on her stomach. Hey, quit swaying. You gonna faint on us? No, I, I'm just a little dizzy. Yeah. Come to a chair, Reggie. Yeah, quite. There you are. How about you, Mr. Mitchell? I, I'm all right. Uh, you killed the snake, Reggie? Yes. The moment I lifted the fan, the thing hissed at me, struck at the fan, and then slid off her abdomen and into a corner where I finished it in a hurry. Then I slipped her into this negligee and brought her here. Uh-huh. There's no sign of fang marks or redness or slowing. 
Yeah. Help me turn her on her face. Right. She isn't likely to have been bitten on her back, I wouldn't think. Mm. Uh, don't let her get her face down the pillow there and smother. Quite. I'm, I'm watching. Okay, Jack. Here's a little black bag. Okay. Open it up and get out that file of brandy. Yes, ma'am. For who? Not for you. But, Jack, they don't give liquor to folks for snake bites no more. Rada hasn't been bitten. She ain't. Thank heaven. Well, if she ain't been bit, then what is the matter with her? Probably saw the snake and fainted. Oh, well, just faint, huh? Uh-oh. Oh, oh. I say, she's coming around. Here. Yeah. Turn her over on her back again. Yeah, right up. Got that brandy ready, Doc? You all say. There uh, she is. Oh, no. Get away. Take it away. It's all right now. Take it easy. <laughs> it's a snake. A snake. Whoop. Help me to hold her down, Reggie. <laughs> easy. That's a girl. Here, Nevada. Drink this. Open your mouth. That's it. Drink it all. There. Uh -huh. Oh, kill it. Kill it. Hey, hey, kill fella, it. what you trying to do? Climb my frame? Oh, I didn't know where I was. You're safe and sound, and nothing's the matter with you except you just had a bad dream. Oh, the heck I did. That's all. Just a bad dream. Bad dream, my eye. Somebody turned a snake loose in my room. Oh, hiya, Pop. Nevada. Nevada, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right, Pop. Mr. Purdy almost got me that time. He's a, a wicked, wicked man. Even if he is your son, a pop, I denounce him. I deny him. He takes after his mother's people. Oh, that snake. Hey. Ooh. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Look at Huey, trying to sneak out on us. Get him and bring him back. Come on, Reggie. We'll get him out in the hall. Right on. Where you think you're going to, son? Let go of me. Ain't trying to sneak out on us, are you? It's none of your business. Oh, now you oughtn't to talk that way to me. Let go of me! Uh, hey! Get him, Reggie! Get him right through! No, 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 no. Take your hands off me! I say, stop! Pull him off! Ouch! He bit me to the bone! Hang on till I get him by the collar! All right, there! All right, now then. Get up on your feet. Let go of my collar! Come on, stand on your feet! Push, but you know that folks that don't get pushed over chairs sometimes get the next bus you're, in? You're choking me. Well, then quit acting like a cross between a bus saw and a barbed wire fence and stand still. I say, will you look at my wrist? Use teeth, slash the flesh to the bone. Sure, ain't you ashamed? No, I'm glad. And look at this thumb. Hmm. Chewed to a gristle, looks like. Yeah, and feels like it. You're liable to get hydrophobia getting bit by a poisonous insect like Huey here. You better get Jack to put some stuff on it. Yeah, I think I will. <laughs> Can you bring Huey back in? Can I bring Huey back in? I just wished he'd try not to come along quiet. I will. I will. Righto. I'll go ahead. Take your hand off my collar. Not a chance, son. Come on now. Come on, Mark. <laughs> now, now that my mother's dead, I... I haven't got anyone. Son, how can you expect to have anybody feel sorry for you the way you act? I, I can't help oh, it. Oh, of course you can help it. For instance, what did you want to go trying to sneak out on us when our back was turned full? I, I just wanted to be alone. Yeah, maybe. Okay, right in here with everybody else now. Oh, here they are. Yeah, here's little Huey, the wild boy from Borneo. He tried to chew Reggie up and spit him out. Joe, check that germicide stings like Billy -o. Yeah, I'll stop in a minute. Oh, hell, yeah, Nevada. Setting up, huh? Yeah, I'm all right. But I'm still looking for the rat who turned that snake loose in my room. Mm, looks like Mr. Purdy's in the neighborhood. Well, he may be tough. But if I ever get my hands on that goon, I'm going to tear off an arm and beat him to death with it. Your father's such language. Sure, Pop. A bit gruesome, but it'd teach him a lesson he wouldn't forget. Hey, Jack, what you want me to do with the boy wonder here? Stand him up against the wall. Stand him up against the wall? No. Stand him against the wall. no, no. Come on, son. You heard what Jack said. Let me go. Stop it. Take his other arm, no. Reggie. Right -o. I don't want to be here. I can't stand being held down. Turn his shoulders to the wall. Uh, right. Uh, all right. Back him up. No. 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 Come on, son. Now stand up and take him. Come on, get back. There he is, Jack. I don't want to interfere, and maybe you boys know what you're doing. I assure you we do. Yeah, sure, but three of you picking on a kid... Ain't that pretty rough? Make them let me go, Nevada. Oh, so now you want to hide behind a woman's skirt, huh? I don't get it. You will in a minute. Reach down, unbutton his coat, Reggie. Quite. No, no, no. no. Uh, hold him, will you, Doc? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I got him. I say, what's this? Hey, yeah. two inches in diameter, fastened around it. Now reach in his coat pocket, Doc. Yeah, uh-huh. Picking on me. Huh? 
It's nothing but a heavy pair of leather gloves. Yeah, gloves that he put on when he took the poisonous snake out of that rubber tube around his waist and let it go in Nevada's room. Huey! Huey, you didn't! Don't believe in Nevada. They're trying to frame Huey me. Huey Carver, how could you do this to me? Mm. How could you turn that horrible, filthy thing loose on me? How could you, Huey? How could you? Well, that was easy for you. No, yeah. it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Should have been after what you did this morning. After what he did this morning? Yeah. After pushing his own mother out of the hotel window four stories up. Jack, <laughs> Huey pushed that and Mitchell out of the window? Yep. And then picked her up and brought her to us, crying and pretending that somebody else done it? That's it. Yeah, but Satin said Mr. Purdy did it. To cover up for Huey. To cover up for her son. Nevada, please. Huey Carver, <laughs> you're the lowest, filthiest, slimiest thing in this whole ugly world. And I mean that. You see, you see, nobody cares about... <laughs> But if Huey killed Satin Mitchell and tried to kill Nevada, then who killed Judy White and Doug Loftus and Ava Blue? And where does Mr. Purdy fit into the murderous scheme of things? In just a moment, new violence enters the picture. But first... Say, you know, I really enjoyed that glass of Fleischmann's yeast and tomato juice you gave me a while ago. I think maybe I'll start drinking yeast regularly. Well, fine. Yeah, but suppose I decided against taking yeast and I was not getting enough of the vitamins it supplies. What had happened? Oh, when we don't get enough of such vitamins in our diet, nothing sudden is apt to happen. We are likely to begin feeling below par, easily fatigued, nervous, mentally depressed, have poor appetite, and feel just generally run down. Hey, what do you mean, begin feeling that way? That's exactly the way I've been feeling for months. How did you say you mixed that yeast and tomato juice? I'm starting tonight. Well, you won't regret it if it's more of the vitamin B complex you need. These vitamins are required for normal vitality, a buoyant sense of well-being. Now, here's all you do. Just mash up a cake of Fleischmann's yeast in a dry glass with a fork till it's thoroughly broken up. Add just a little cool milk, water, or tomato juice. Stir till smoothly blended. Fill the glass, give it another stir, and here you are, Fleischmann's fresh yeast in tomato juice. Drink it, America. To your health. <laughs> Huey, that makes you just about the lowest thing on two feet. Let me alone. But, Jack, I don't understand. How did you know it was Huey? I'll explain all that later. What about it, Huey? You want to say anything for yourself before we turn you over to the police? I couldn't help it. I had to do it. A bad boy. A bad, bad boy. Hold it, Pop. You had to kill your mother? Yes. You had to turn that snake loose in Nevada's room? Yes, I had to. And you had to strangle Judy White? That cute little girl, Judy. You killed her, too? I didn't want to. It was so easy. But I didn't want to. Don't give me that old malarkey, Hugh Carver. If you didn't want to, why did you do it? I had to. He made me. Made you? Yes. He said he'd have me locked up in an institution where I couldn't get any more stuff. Huey, you an addict? Yes. Ah, should have known it. <laughs> have spotted you right away. Oh, yeah, especially after running into that nest of snowbirds out of Mr. Purdy's apartment house. Didn't I always say you? He was a bad boy. You terrible, wicked, horrible old man. I say. Well, no, look, you... look, look, hang on to him, Reggie. Yeah. I got him. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's better. Not just hold still. Jack, the sooner we turn this crybaby murder over to police, the better I'm going to like you. Yeah, I'm not through with him yet. He yeah, ain't, huh? No. Huey, and you're going to say that you were forced to kill because Purdy threatened to have you locked up in an institution for addicts if he didn't? Not Mr. Purdy. Not Mr. Purdy? No. It hasn't been Mr. Purdy any of the time. It's been... Oh, no. No. Jack. Jack, Huey's been shot. That's where those shots come from. I didn't see anything. Where's he hit at, Jack? He's dead weight hanging on us. Yeah. He's dead, period. I say. Shot through the heart. Lay him on the floor. Hey! Hey, come here. Look at Pop. What's the matter with old Cooper Mitchell? It's a heart attack. It's the worst one he's ever had. Oh, go on, look how red his face is. Yeah. Congestion. Got any of those heart pills or medicine? Yeah, yeah, he always keeps them in his vest pocket. Good. From the way the bullet entered Huey's heart, the killer must have been in the window just behind Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, and the smell of burnt powder stronger over here, too. You guys might take the trouble to go out and see what you can find outside if you're not nailed to the floor. Hey, did you give Pop one of those pills? Yeah. Oh, he looks terrible, Jack. Yeah, I know. I think this is A.B. Cooper Mitchell's last heart attack. Oh, no. I'm afraid that... Look out. There goes the spark of life and spirit out of a very tired old man. Yeah. 
Oh, Pop. No. Shall I cover him over, Jack? Yeah. Wait. Can't you... Can I turn him a little... Lay him out comfortable? Yeah, just, just a minute, Ray. All right. There. Hey. What's the matter? Look. Laying down here back of him. I say. A pistol. A doggone shooting pistol. Hey, dog, don't touch it. You picked it up with my handkerchief. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Still warm. Still warm? What does that mean? It means it looks like A.B. Cooper Mitchell himself shot little old Huey. I killed Huey? I don't believe it. Well, all I know well, is... Look, you it. said yourself somebody must have leaned in the window and shot Huey. Why couldn't he drop the gun on the lounge behind Pop when Pop keeled over? Well, I think we can soon answer that. Turn on that floor lamp and bring it over here, Reggie. Right, huh? Hey, was Mitchell right or left-handed? He was left-handed. Uh-huh. Then we'll examine his left hand. Where do you want the light, Jack? Right over his hand here. Yeah. Down close. That's it. Huh. Look. Little black specks embedded in his skin. Gunpowder. Hey, you... You mean Pop did kill Huey? No doubt of it. And the gun will probably show his fingerprints. Oh, but Why? Why would Pop want to do a thing like that? Because I think Huey was just about to tell the truth about him. The truth? What truth? Don't you remember I said, so Mr. Purdy was going to have you placed in an institution. And Huey said, not Mr. Purdy. It hasn't been Mr. Purdy any of the time. Hey, and Huey was just about to tell on old A.B. here, and A.B. had to shoot him, and then the excitement the old boy's heart quit on him. Exactly. Yeah, but what? What was Huey going to tell? That Mitchell here made Huey kill Judy White, and his mother sat in Mitchell. And made the attempt to kill you with a poisonous snake. Golly, I... I wonder if... Hey, can I have that little gold key off Pop's watch chain? Why? It opens a little wall safe I've never seen the inside of. It's got stuff in it I'd like to know about. Where is this wall safe? In Pop's room. Okay, here's the key. Reggie, you go with her. See, she doesn't hide or destroy anything. All right. Well, don't go on, Jack. You think Huey killed Doug Loftus and Ava Blue... Hey, wait a minute. Huey couldn't have killed Ava Blue, and neither could old A.B. here. What's that? Why, sure, don't you remember? Huey was up with us in the A-1 agency when when uh, Ava was run down by that automobile down in front. That's right. And old A.B. was having a heart attack in the inner office. Sure he was. Little old Jerry Booker was nursemaiding him. So if Huey or A.B. didn't kill Ava... Hey, who's that? Probably the police. We expecting the police? Why not? There's been shooting. Somebody was bound to investigate. Well, don't stand there. Go let him in. Okay, okay. Well, hold your horses, will you? Hi, Doc. Hey, Jerry. Look what I got in tow. Mr. Purdy. Yeah, Mr. Purdy. He's had a gun in my back all the way over. Can we come in? Well, I guess so. Why did you come here? Never mind the gap. Shut the door. Oh, sure. Where's everybody? They're in here. And don't try nothing funny. Hmm. With a pistol pointing at me? Doc, what's the matter? Mr. Purdy, Jack. Mr. Purdy with a shooting pistol. Jerry, what are you doing here? Uh, Mr. Purdy came to the A-1 office and, and pulled a pistol on me. Said he'd shoot me if I didn't bring him to you folks quick. So here he is. Hey, what's the matter with Huey? Dead. Oh, yeah. And Co- Cooper Mitchell? Dead, too. Yeah. Sit down, everybody. Sit down, huh? Yes, yeah, sit down. I want to talk. Golly, Reggie, can you teach her that? Don't none of you move. Wait till Jack hears about this. Talk about your double cross and old he Billy Goat, Zach. Hey. Come in and sit down. I say, Mr. Purdy. You too. Well, right. Purdy. Yeah. This makes eight of us, including two corpses. You ain't planning to make no more corpses, are you, Mr. Purdy? No. And my name isn't Mr. Purdy. Hey. I say. Sure, I can talk just as decently as any of the rest of you. It's only as Purdy I talk like this. Well, if you're not Purdy, who are you? I'm I'm Benny Benjamin, character actor in the films. Not Purdy the gangster and killer and son of Cooper Mitchell? No, I'm an actor and a darn good one. How I ever got myself in this mess, I wish somebody would tell me. Of all the lousy ways of making money. You mean you ain't a dangerous character? No, I ain't a dangerous character. I'm Benny Benjamin, can't you hear? Well, how about putting up that gun? Well, it's not loaded. Look. And I've been dying a thousand deaths with an empty gun in my back. Sorry, but I had to find Packard in a hurry. Why? I just found out I was mixed up with trouble. I want to clear myself before the police catch on. Well, well, the floor is yours. Look, I've been practically starving to death here in Hollywood. A couple of months ago, a voice called me up and asked me if I'd do a private job for him as a gag. Offered me 500 bucks for a month's work. Cooper Mitchell? I didn't know it then, but it was. 
Said I was to take the name of Mr. Purdy and live in a dilapidated old apartment house out on the beach. Said I was to let on like I was a long-lost son of A.B. Cooper Mitchell. Yeah, what happened? Nothing happened. Except that I found out there were a lot of hopheads smoking marijuana in the basement. I told the voice... Old A.B.? Yeah, I told him about it, and he said not to worry. I wouldn't be bothered. He gave me another 500 to go on with the impersonation. Oh, uh-huh. and then things did begin to happen? Yeah. First, Satin Mitchell came to see me with a story about her being the ex-wife of Mitchell and wanting my help to get the whole estate. What'd you do? Next time the voice called me, I told him about it. Looks like that's what he was waiting for. He told me exactly what to say to her and how to handle her. And the next thing was getting Huey, her son, out of jail. Yeah, we turned him in as a murder suspect. How do you get him out? I don't know. The voice told me just what to do, and I did it, and Huey was turned over to me. Well, old boy must have had some influence on her. Mitchell, or the voice as you know him by, told you to play along with Satin? Pretend to help her get his money? Yeah, it's all right here in his diary. Diary? Yeah, that's what Reggie and I found. This diary was in his wall safe. Oh, writing an autobiography, eh? Well, I don't know anything about that, but everything I did was on the voice's instruction. The night Huey got away and came to you folks, and I tried to get him back, and Doc Long there jumped me on the stairs. Well, I should have thought by this time you'd have realized all this wasn't just a gag. Mm, it was beginning to look pretty sinister, but I hadn't done anything I couldn't explain to the police, and I did need those $500 bills. Well, what about that St. Valentine's Day massacre gag when you line Doc and Jerry and me up against the wall? I didn't know what the payoff was. The voice told me to do it and that he'd come in and take over the waiter arrived first, and you took a high dive out the window. Yeah. And that's when I began to think I'd better do some checking up. Things were getting too hot. Pointing guns at people and things can get a fellow in a lot of trouble. Boy and half. Yeah. So I got to checking up on the people the voice had sent to me, and I found a lot of them were dead. Doug Loftus, Judy White, Ava Blue, Satin Mitchell. All folks the voice had sent to me. And then I found out the voice was the millionaire A.B. Cooper Mitchell himself. You didn't suspect before? No. He'd mentioned Cooper Mitchell, but as someone else. I didn't catch on until I began to check up and found I was all mixed up in a murder scheme. Well, who killed Doug Loftus and Ava Blue? Mitchell, I guess. No, we know he didn't kill Ava Blue. It's in his diary here, Jack. Yeah? Yeah, listen. I had planned to kill Ava Blue and had slipped a list of eight kinds of murder in his pocket. I always saw my intended victim carried one of my murder lists. He was accidentally killed by a hit-run driver before I could act, while I was out with a heart attack in the A-1 office. What a perfect alibi for any murder I have committed, or may commit. Doggone. Pop, that's awful. Yeah, and you want to know why he was killing and making Huey kill? It's all right here. Listen, in every murder for inheritance, it's always the heirs who kill the rich relatives. Now, well, this time, it's different. I detest everyone who is eligible to inherit my money, so I am determined there will not be one of them alive when I die. Not one. Since he was a lad in this house, I have given Huey Carver narcotics so he'd be under my control to use in this scheme of mine. He has been of great value. Great guy. What a brute. Yeah, poor Huey. Yeah, and that murder plot included me. Well, you did survive him to that. Yeah. I did, didn't I? Yeah, from fan dancer to multimillionaire in one afternoon. That's some jump. Maybe you can learn to do a dance with $1,000 bills instead of fans. My public. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just about takes care of the case of eight kinds of murder. Yeah. Now what are we going to do, Jack? What do you say to taking 13 weeks off and going fishing? Oh, fella, I hate fishing. Let's go where there's some female women. You're going fishing and like it. No women? No women. Ain't that awful, Reggie, for 13 weeks? No women. Now, just a word to good housewives. If you bake at home, use Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast, the household favorite of four generations. And if you want to add a good supply of vitamin B complex to your daily diet... Drink Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast twice every day. Yes, drink it, America. To your help. The eighth and final chapter of the adventures of the three comrades with eight kinds of murder is now complete. I Love a Mystery, written by Carlton E. Morse, is ringing down the curtain for the annual summer vacation. We wish to thank all those who have been with us during the past nine months, and we hope sincerely you will be with us again this fall. I Love a Mystery has come to you through the courtesy of the makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast. Monday, June 30th. In the first half of 1941, 
millions have enjoyed richer, more delicious tea. Tender Leaf brand tea made with young, tender tea leaves. In packages, two convenient sizes, or improved tea balls. Tell your grocer, Tender Leaf Tea. This is the National Broadcasting Company. What makes someone kill? Not only innocent people, but sometimes the very people who loved and trusted them. What imagined wrongs could drive a deluded individual to seek revenge by taking another person's life? What lengths will people go to to get what they want? Murderous Minds, Volume 2, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the life of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Each tale is sordid, twisted, and worthy of newspaper headlines. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies turned reality, this book invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness – that of the killer. Paired with an in-depth account of each case, it will be a nightmarish journey to the darkest reaches of the mind of these real-life murderers. Murderous Minds, Volume 2, written by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The haunted Solsishwa Point Lighthouse was built in 1892, but the tower had to be rebuilt, so the lighthouse was officially completed in 1895. Solsishwa means only choice and marks a small harbor on Lake Michigan. French fur traders gave the name used for the lighthouse as the area was the only choice for safety if boats were headed to the Straits of Mackinac. Today, only the haunted lighthouse is active in the area that was once a bustling fishing community. All of the original buildings stand today, including explosive storehouses, a fog signal building, and the two-family red brick keeper's house attached to the lighthouse tower. Still operational today, the haunted Solsishwa Point Lighthouse was automated by the U.S. Coast Guard in the 1970s, and the site now houses a museum which is open from Memorial Day to mid-October, seven days a week. Visitors to the lighthouse have experienced some haunted happenings, such as items being moved and the sound of footsteps climbing the tower stairs, as if a lighthouse keeper is still on duty. But more than a lighthouse keeper is thought to haunt the Seoul Sichua Point Lighthouse. A former lighthouse keeper's brother used to visit and was captain of a ship. Captain James Townsend fell ill suddenly during one of his visits with his brother Joseph and eventually died at the keeper's house. His body was embalmed in the house basement and put on display for quite some time until family and friends could make their journey to the isolated Seoul Sichua Point and pay their final respects. Since that time, many a visitor has experienced the smell of what is presumably the captain's cigars, as well as his humor. Tour guides say he likes to turn the hat backwards on the mannequin dressed as a lighthouse keeper and hide cigars in the pockets of the jacket from time to time. Does the good Captain Townsend spend his days and nights at the lighthouse at Seoul Sichua Point? Could his brother be the keeper who is still on duty at the haunted lighthouse? The New London Ledge Light Haunted Lighthouse was built in 1909 in New London Harbor, Connecticut. Being one of the last lighthouses built in New England, the New London Ledge Light is a unique three-story red brick building which stands alone at the eastern end of the Long Island Sound. It was built to be elegant by standing in the water in front of some very large homes on the nearby shoreline. Sitting quietly atop a concrete pier, this lighthouse simply looks the part of being haunted, 
being strangely mysterious. The New London Ledge Light does have a tragic story and a haunted history. Purportedly, the ghost of a former lightkeeper named Ernie jumped off of the roof of the lighthouse after his wife ran off with the Block Island ferry captain. It's believed that Ernie still haunts the lighthouse, and stories from former U.S. Coast Guardsmen who formerly resided there might be the proof. Many have reported having the sheets ripped off of their bed, doors opening and closing on their own, televisions turning off, the foghorn being turned off and on, as well as boats being untied and left adrift. Some claim to have seen Ernie washing the lighthouse decks. The New London Ledge Light was investigated in 2005 by TV's Scariest Places on Earth and in 2006 by Sci-Fi Channel's Ghost Hunters. The light is now automated and maintained by the U.S. Coast Guard, but restoration is underway of the building itself as of this podcast. Also, plans are in the works to create a museum slash bed and breakfast that can be opened to the public. I still have a few more of the world's most haunted lighthouses to tell you about when Weird Darkness Returns. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built. where the O'Rourke family had lived for almost a hundred years was known as Island McGee. And the long, narrow, hilly road that stretched between high thorn hedges to the nearby town bore the name of Nohead Lonin. Each Monday morning, it was Kathleen O'Rourke's custom to walk down the Lonin to the village post office. Since she started out at an early hour, the road was usually deserted. But on a certain morning in June... As she passed the cottage of her neighbor, Molly Donovan, she saw Molly standing at the gate, beckoning to her. Kathleen, you wouldn't be going for the post now, would you, darling? That I would, Molly. And could you be doing a great favor for me while you're there now? It's my brother, Patrick. Three months he's gone now, Kathleen, and not a word has he written me. And I'm not worried about him. So you'd be wanting me to inquire at the post office if there's a letter waiting for you? That's it. If it's not too much to be asking you. It is nothing at all, Molly. Wait right here. I'll be back. And Kathleen and I continued along the road. At the post office, she collected her family's mail, but the postmaster shook his head and said there was nothing for the Donovan household. And so Kathleen turned back toward home. And it was then, just after she'd passed the outskirts of the village and started up the Noed Lonin, it was then that she saw the man. He was tall. She had a feeling that he was handsome. A few moments later, she stood at Molly Donovan's gate. No word from the brother. No word and nothing at all. Oh, heaven help him. Now I am worried for sure. But Kathleen O'Rourke did not stay to reassure her neighbor. She sped quickly on toward home. And only when she reached the top of the hill did she stop to look behind her. Well, now, what do you know? I thought the lad was a stranger in these parts. But there he is, standing at the gate, talking to Molly Donovan. It was not until the following Monday... When she passed by the Donovan cottage again, that she had a chance to ask Molly a few questions. Who was he now, Molly? The lad that was walking right behind me last Monday morning. I saw no lad, Kathy. How can you say that, Molly? You know yourself he stopped to talk to you? It's mistaken, yeah, lass. No one said a word to me that morning, besides yourself. 
But I saw him with my own eyes. He was standing here at this gate. If this is some joke you're playing, darling, you're picking a poor time for it. Sure, and my heart's too heavy even for that. Tis my brother, Padre. We heard last night. He's gone, darling. Washed overboard. Lost at sea. It happened early last Monday morning. He must have died just when you were running up Mohead Lone. Yes, Molly Donovan's brother died at the very moment the strange young man appeared on the road behind Kathleen O'Rourke. And though Kathleen saw that man following after her, saw him stop at the gate and talk to Molly, Molly herself was unaware of his presence. This is only one of many such stories out of the country of error. A story incredible but true. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Point Lookout Lighthouse. Phil was in the Navy, but we'd know each other since high school. He'd been the sort of angry kid who never met a fight he wouldn't back down from, which was why it was so shocking to see those eyes alive with fear after he told me, over a beer, about the time he had to do some maintenance work in the Point Lookout Lighthouse. But fear was there, along with a certainty I only questioned once. You're sure you saw something, like something supernatural, I asked him. He raised an eyebrow and, without speaking, reminded me he was a guy who wasn't prone to superstition. He had seen, or more accurately, felt something. But then he had been working in what's been called the country's most haunted lighthouse, which sits by the mass grave of thousands of souls. I shouldn't have been that surprised. The Point Lookout Lighthouse is situated in Point Lookout State Park, a spit of land that sits at the tip of St. Mary's County, itself a rural peninsula that claws at the crossroads of the Potomac River and Chesapeake Bay. Although the county, as locals call St. Mary's, is rapidly becoming an exurb of Washington, D.C., 80 miles to the north, for centuries it has been a rural backwater, draped in oak and pine woods in her interior fringed by Estuarian Marsh at her edges. During the American Civil War, Maryland posed a dilemma for the Union. The state surrounded Washington, D.C., but many of her citizens owned slaves and sympathized with the Confederacy. St. Mary's County, at the state's extreme southern tip, was a particularly troublesome enclave of Confederate support. St. Mary's was also isolated, sparsely populated, and easily defensible which presented the federal government with an elegant solution – to intimidate local Southern sympathizers and house an increased number of Confederate POWs, a prison of war camp was created at Point Lookout in July 1863. In coming months, thousands of prisoners would flow into the camp grounds. Historical accounts describe squalid conditions, prisoners contracting illness from the swamps, wells becoming contaminated and protection against the elements, freezing, damp Chesapeake wind in winter, thick, mosquito-laden humidity in summer, was minimal. Lacking barracks, the prisoners slept in flimsy tents. By late February 1864, many of the guards charged with watching the Confederates were black Union soldiers. 
Historical records suggested both prisoners and wardens understood the ramifications of a newly reversed racial power dynamic. By the time the war ended, over 50,000 Confederates had been housed at the point, and 4,000 of them were left buried in the Maryland marshes, the victims of starvation, typhoid fever, and exposure to the elements. In time, other disasters added to the tiny area's death toll, most notably an 1878 fire that wiped out a local hotel, and in the same year the sinking of the steamship Express with the loss of 22 lives. Today, spirits are regularly seen and heard in the land and water now designated Point Lookout State Park. Typical sightings describe a slender man, although not THE slender man, loping across the road or into salt-kissed groves of loblolly pine. One former ranger recalls a regular apparition of a man running at full stride away from the camp's historic smallpox hospital, a regular escape route for prisoners. Other rangers tell of frequent low-lying damp fogs that suddenly become impenetrable and chilled with eddies of otherworldly energies that set their dogs into a panic. Recording devices left in the pine bottomlands and by local peers often take up disjointed snippets of conversation at all hours of the night. A woman saying, let us take no objection to what they are doing. A man snapping, fire if they get too close to you. And a child asking to play in the water. But it is Point Lookout's lighthouse, now owned by the state, that inspires the most consistent paranormal exposure. Former park ranger Gerald Sword said that his Belgian shepherd would regularly lunge at unseen figures and that once he had seen a young man in soldier's attire walk to the lighthouse, then run away into thin air. Voices and piano music would drift through the lighthouse halls and fishermen would regularly tell him about hearing phantom cries for help on the water. My friend Phil told me that after a few minutes alone in the basement of the lighthouse, he had felt his skin prickle with a foreboding that grew so alarmingly fast it left him in a cold sweat. As he left with three co-workers, none of them spoke to each other for a few minutes. When they did, the first comment was, did you feel that? All four of them nodded and said nothing else. The Hasita Head Lighthouse is located in Florence, Oregon, and overlooks the Pacific Ocean. Built in 1894, it took five years to build due to its steep location, standing 205 feet above the water. This haunted lighthouse is known to be haunted by a friendly elderly lady who appears as a smoky gray apparition. Her name is Rue, and this gray lady has a habit of moving objects when work is being done, especially at the keeper's house. The grave of a baby has been found on the haunted Hasita Head Lighthouse grounds, and it's believed to possibly be Rue's child. Rue has not only been known to move items but to also set off fire alarms while workers paint, open and close cupboard doors, and she has been heard walking upstairs. A worker who once encountered the Grey Lady refused to return to the attic again. After he accidentally broke an attic window while doing work on the outside of the house, he elected to repair it from the outside. That night, workers could hear the glass that he left lying on the attic floor scraping upon the wooden boards. Upon checking the attic the next morning, they found the glass was neatly swept up into a pile for them. Many have seen Rue peering down at them from an attic window, which only substantiates the claims of the Grey Lady still living within the haunted Hasita Head Lighthouse. Today, the Lighthouse Keeper's house is a bed and breakfast. I imagine that Rue is very pleased to have her home now so well kept. The Seguin Island Lighthouse was commissioned by George Washington in 1795, and it's located off the southern coast of Georgetown, Maine. Seguin Island is just two miles off the mouth of the Kennebec River. The haunted lighthouse was rebuilt in 1819, replacing its original wooden tower with stone, and in 1857 it again was reconstructed with cut stone and the addition of a brick lightkeeper's quarters. The rocky and ledged area has long been hazardous to ships, and the stories of maritime mishaps abound, 
including the sighting of a 135-foot sea serpent in 1875. Among the long list of lighthouse keepers at Seguin Island is the tragic story of a mid-1800s man and wife. Being isolated and lonely, the wife of the keeper received the gift of a piano which she had shipped to the home. As she was only able to play but one song over and over, it's believed it eventually drove him mad into rage in which he took an axe to the piano, then the wife and himself. Piano music is said to be heard over the waters today, but haunting melodies are not the only ghostly sounds that have been heard at the haunted light. Apparently, a young girl died on the island and is buried not far from the lighthouse grounds. Keepers have reported seeing the ghost of the girl running up and down the stairs, laughing and waving at them. The Tower Foghorn Building and Keepers' Quarters seem to have the most haunted activity, and the U.S. Coast Guard who stayed there has had plenty of stories to tell. Various ghostly sounds, sights as well as furniture being moved, jackets falling off of hooks and missing items have all been reported. Probably the most prolific of haunted Seguin Island Lighthouse tales is when the Coast Guard was decommissioning the lighthouse and packing up items in 1985. The warrant officer was awakened that very night after packing to the apparition of a man dressed in oilskins shaking his bed. It seems the ghost had a message when he purportedly said, don't take the furniture, please leave my home alone. The next day, the boat that was carrying the furniture to the mainland sunk when an accident happened while lowering the loaded boat into the water. Was this ghost a former lightkeeper? The list of lighthouse keepers is long here, and due to its rich, long history and tragic stories, it's no wonder the lighthouse is haunted. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. afraid for a moment that you had forgotten our appointment. Why, you almost scared me to death. And that won't do after all the pains I've taken to scare you. You remember me, don't you? I'm your host on behalf of the makers of Carter's Pills. And you're to be my guest tonight in the mysterious circle of the inner sanctum. Come in, friends, won't you? Thank you. Uh, take that chair to the fire. Good. And you'll become accustomed to the dim light in a moment. Uh, 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 don't get too comfortable, because we'll have you out of that chair with thrills and chills, shivers and quivers. <laughs> You're on our side, aren't you? 
<laughs> You'd better be. But don't worry. Instead of the arch criminals haunting us, we're going to haunt them. We're going to scare the daylights out of them. Yes. Welcome, then, friends. Welcome to the mysterious circle of the inner sanctum. And listen to as weird and strange a tale as ever was told. The amazing death of Mrs. Putnam. The night is dismal. A light shines uncertainly in the room of a large, gloomy mansion. Suddenly, a sobbing, hysterical woman slams the door shut, rushes to the telephone. Get the police, quick. The police. Quiet, quiet, woman. Oh, hurry. Please, hurry. Hello? 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 Police department? This is Mrs. Putnam. You've got to save me from them. They'll kill me. Put that telephone down. Help, they're going to kill me. I'm being murdered. Where are you? Oh, Where they're are killing you? me. Help, help. Oh. Hello? 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 Hello, operator. This is Jeff Hansen, police headquarters. Place the call that just came through to us. Hurry! That's funny, Jeff. Did you hear what I heard, Porky? I sure did, unless we're both having the same dream. Hold it, Porky. Yes? Yes, operator? Hanson, Jeff Hanson. You have? That's swell. Write this down, Porky. Yes, sure. Yes? The Putnam House, Maple Street. Thank you very much. The Putnam House? Yeah. Say, that's the first time in centuries we've heard that name in the police department. Come on, Porky. Someone in that house is in great danger. We've got to get there and quickly. But you put all the way down on the gas. Oh, what's all the excitement, Jeff? It's just another murder case or something. We get them wholesale. Maybe you're right, Porky. You're too jumpy lately, Jeff. What's the matter with you? Oh, nothing. Just on edge. You ought to get married. Then you'd have so many other troubles, you wouldn't have time to think of yourself. You know, everybody should get married. At least once. <laughs> Especially you, Porky. Oh, I'd get married tomorrow if I knew a girl who'd love me for myself alone. Keep your eyes on the road, Miss Advice to the Lovelorn. All right, all right. I forgive you for the crack. Now, look, Jeff. You and me is a great detective. Only you can solve everything but the mysteries of the heart. So what does nature do? Nature endows me with the wisdom which you ain't got in that department. Ain't nature wonderful? Sending me to straighten out your amours? Now, first of all, you got to learn to treat love light. This is Maple Street, Porky. Oh, okay. I'll take up the lessons in love where I left off later. Pull up, Miss Lovelorn. Here we are. Let's go. All right, Jeff. Ah, it's a pretty old house. Ain't exactly a haunted place, but uh, a ghost could feel at home here. No, me silly. This house is fairly modern. What are you muttering about? I'm counting the stairs. Didn't you teach me to observe everything? <laughs> Seven, <laughs> <laughs> now remember, keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. You know how reliable I am, Jeff. Yeah, I do. Yes. We're from police headquarters. One moment, please. You can't come in like that. It's all right, Williamson. Yes, Miss Lewis. Come in, please. Thank you, Miss. My name is Jeff Hanson. This is poor uh, Ed Lamb, better known as Porky. I'm Lois Putnam. I do, Miss Putnam. Did you say you were from police headquarters? Yes. That's odd. How did you find out so soon? We had a telephone call. From whom? It was a woman. I believe she said her name was Putnam. What? Oh, no. When did you get this call? Only a few minutes ago. The woman screamed that she was being murdered. She cried out for help. Oh, no, no. How... What in heaven's name are you talking about? My aunt is dead. Dead? Yes. She died two hours ago. Her name was Mrs. Putnam? Yes, Martha Putnam. You say, you say your aunt died two hours ago? Yes. But we received a phone call for help only 20 minutes ago. Oh, that's impossible. Are you sure the call came from here? It was traced to your number. Besides, I believe the woman said her name was Mrs. Putman. Isn't that right, Porky? Yeah, it sounded like yeah, it. This is some idiot's idea of humor. The poor woman has been dead more than two hours. 
Lois, you should rest. You haven't closed your eyes. I will, Doctor. These men are from police headquarters. Oh? This is Dr. Holloway. Doctor? Detective Hanson, did you say? Uh, Jeff Hanson. This is Ed Lamb. Hi, Doctor. Were the police informed of your aunt's death, Lois? They traced a strange phone call back to this house, Doctor. Somebody screamed for help. From this house? Yes. Then why didn't we hear it? Huh? Perhaps we made a mistake. However, we're forced to sort of look around. Please forgive us, Miss Buckner. Do whatever you like. Thank you. Well, we thought you'd better lie down, Lois. I'll be all right, sir. Borgie, I want you to make a thorough search of the house and don't let anything go unnoticed. You betcha. Oh, Doctor. Yes. Be back in a moment, though. What is it? If you don't mind, Doctor, I'd... Uh... Do you wish to ask me questions? Please. But all right. What caused Mrs. Putnam's death? The causes of her death were quite natural. A blood clot lodged itself in the veins of her heart. You may have heard it called coronary thrombosis. How many members are there in the family? Well, there's Lois and Mrs. Putnam's brother. He's very ill. I guess sight is failing. Uh. Is there anyone else? Yes, there's Joel Adams, the gardener. He lives in the back of the garden. Mm -hmm. He and the butler have been with Mr. Putnam for years. Mm. Oh, uh, would you mind, Doctor, if I looked at Mrs. Putnam? If you wish, just follow me. A fascinating mystery, hmm, friends? A strange telephone call late at night. A woman screams for help, a dog barks, two shots ring out, and then the police dash to the house and find that the woman died of natural causes two hours earlier. Hmm. Riddle me that, my friend. Oh, have no fear for the day of ghost-like voices from the dead and the day of superstition is past. Or is it? Hmm? <laughs> We shall see. We shall see. This way, Mr. Hanson. Thank you. Why do you keep this door locked? Oh, simply to avoid any scenes. They're all so high strung. Oh. oh. What's the matter with your hand, Doctor? You mean with bandage? You hurt yourself? But it's just clumsiness. While cutting some gauze, I slipped my hand. It bled rather profusely. I'm sorry for all this inconvenience, but in my business, it's wiser to check on everything. I understand. You wish to examine the body more thoroughly? No. No, I don't think so. She looks rather natural for a corpse. Here we go. Yes. yes. May I see the butler now? Yes, this couple will bring him in just a few moments. After I see him, I'd like to talk to the others, too. Oh, you'll be tactful with Lois, won't you? She's quite broken up. She was attached to the old lady. Of course. Oh, uh, did you ring for me, Dr. Holloway? Yes, Williamson. Detective Hanson wishes to talk to you. Yes, sir. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'll take a look at Lois. Quite all right, Doctor. Excuse me. Your name is Williamson, I gathered. Yes, sir. How long have you been working for Mrs. Putnam? Thirty-two years. Long time, isn't it? Yes, sir. By the way, did you hear any odd noises or screaming this evening? No, sir. You did hear two shots, though, didn't you? Uh, uh, no, 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 sir. You're not frightened, are you, Williamson? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. This house isn't what it seems on the outside. Oh? No, it's full of hatred. Everyone hated Mrs. Putnam, and she hated all of us. The Lord found vengeance. She didn't deserve to live. There wasn't a kind thought in her head. Who killed her? The devil took her. Who fired those two shots? Lightning struck twice. Where is the dog? In Hades with his mistress. Ugh. Don't think you're fooling me, Williamson, by avoiding my questions. Take me to Mr. Putnam's room. Yes, sir. It's right here. He's very ill, though. Shall I knock? No. No, you may go. Yes, sir. Who is it? I'm sorry to intrude. Are you Mr. Putnam? Who are you? Detective Hanson, police headquarters. Oh, the police, eh? What are you doing in my house? I thought the house belonged to your sister. It belongs to me now. What business is it of yours? Who else would you leave everything to? Mr. Putnam, did anything unusual happen to your sister earlier this evening? I mean, has she been ill? A cat was never ill in her life. Would there be any reason for anyone murdering her? Eh? Uh, but... Murder? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. 
He's hurt each and every one of us. She ruined Lois' life by sending her fiancé away many years ago. She made me into the wreck I am with her cruel tongue and her devilish disposition. She was responsible for the death of the gardener's wife long ago. She hasn't done a kind thing in her life. If she's been murdered, then I say good riddance. Is it possible that all of you had given her cause to treat you that way? Don't you dare say that. You stupid, foolish maniac. You didn't know her. How dare you? Get out of my room. Get out of my house. Get out of my... <laughs> oh, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Putnam. I didn't mean to upset you. I'll go now. Yes. Hey, Jeff. Yes, Porky. Hey, I've been looking for you. Yes? Yeah, I've been all over the house. I checked on everything. Fifteen rooms, nineteen windows, eight beds, three fireplaces, and three bathrooms. And nothing looks suspicious? No. You think maybe there is some mistake, Jeff? I don't know. A phone call being placed here is absolute. They never make a mistake. But her voice and her death almost two hours before we got the call... That's a strange. I must confess I'm stumped. Did you talk to everyone? I'd like to talk to the gardener. But right now, we'll pretend that everything's all right. And we made a mistake. We'll drive away and then come back later. You mean you really ain't thoroughly convinced? That's right, Porky. I've got a hunch that we're up against a case that's stranger than any we've ever known or heard of. Get in the car, Porky, and don't look back. Right, Jeff. I don't want them to think that we're even slightly suspicious. They may be watching us from the window. Throw on your lights and get the car started. Yep. Porky. What, Jeff? Don't move. Just look over there. Where? Right straight in the beam of the light. Why, well, I don't... What do you mean? In the garden. That mound of earth. It looks kind of fresh. Right. Holy Mazuma. You think maybe somebody's buried under there? We'll soon find out. Drive the car down a few blocks. We'll come back on foot and very quietly. Jump a catfish, Jeff. So loud, Porky. Don't hit the rock. Just loosen it. How much deeper are we going to dig, Jack? The earth is still soft. We haven't reached what we're after. What are we after? We'll know soon enough. You think the old lady might be buried here and the body in the house is somebody else? I don't know. Hey, Jeff. Huh? Jeff, I, I hit something fine with my shovel. Feels like a body. All right. Don't use the shovel anymore. We'll dig with our hands. Porky, you're right. It is a body. Yeah, it feels like it's wrapped up in a rug of some kind. All right. Get a grip on it. We'll pull it up. Okay. Let's go. It's... It's the dog. The dog we heard barking on the phone. Then there were shots. And that woman's voice did come from this house. They killed the dog and the woman, too. Ah, are you completely mystified? Wondering about the strange death of Mrs. Putnam? And what will happen next? <laughs> Well, there's no need to be frightened. We know how old-fashioned it is to stop like this suddenly and leave you in mid-air wondering about the outcome of the story. Oh, uh, are you in mid-air? Good. Good. But we assure you everything will come out all right. We won't let you down. And uh, this is as good a time as any to remind you of someone else who won't let you down. The makers of Carter's Little Liver Pills. When you don't feel good, try Carter's Little Liver Pills. They do the work of calomel, but have no calomel in them. For they are simple pills made of vegetable drugs. They wake up the flow of one of our most vital digestive juices. When this vital juice flows at the rate of two pints a day, it helps to 
digest our food, and bring back the glorious feeling that goes with regularity. Then most folks feel like happy days are here again. But be sure you get the genuine Carter's Little Liver Pills. Now let's solve tonight's inner sanctum mystery. Hmm, where were we? Oh, yes. Jeff and Porky had just unearthed the body of a dog. The dog we heard barking on the phone. Then there were shots, and that woman's voice did come from this house. They killed the dog and the woman, too. Oh, I just swallowed a lump that had nails on it, Jeff. Hey, Porky, now I'm dead. What's the idea throwing me right in the... Shh, shh. Someone came to the window. Yeah, but you didn't have to throw me right into the grave. Sorry. Here, I'll help you out. Oh. <laughs> They've left the window. Now, look, you stay here, Porky. I'm going in to talk to the gardener. You watch the house. I'll be right back. Hey, you ain't going to leave me here with this dead dog, are you? Shh, quiet. What do you want? I'm from police headquarters. You better let me in. What do you want? I want some information about that dog that was buried in your garden. Uh, you're crazy. Who buried it there? There's no dog in my garden. Was there a dog in the house? I don't know. You'd better answer my questions, Mr. Adams, unless you prefer going to jail. I don't know anything. Who killed Mrs. Putnam? Everybody. Everybody hated her. What do you mean by that? Everyone in that house wanted her to die. Her brother cursed her. Williamson might have poisoned her. What about you? Me? I... I didn't hate her anymore. He promised to leave all her money to me. Oh? Why? Well, it was her only sign of repentance. Why, no other reason? None that might be your business. Did you hear any shots from the house this evening? I was away. Uh, Jeff! Jeff! What is it, Porky? Hey, come quick, Jeff! What's happened? I had a brainstorm. Hurry, Jeff, hurry, come on. You'd better not leave your house, Mr. Adams. I'll be here. What's up, Porky? The windows. Huh? While I'm out here watching the house, I casually count everything. The stairs again. I count the colored bricks and the large bricks, and then I count the windows. Count them, Jeff. What are you driving at? Count them. Count them. Come on. Walk around the house. Count them. Two, four, six, eight, ten, fourteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty windows. What? Great galloping ghost. Twenty windows on the outside, and you said you counted... Nineteen on the inside. That means that there's one window camouflaged on the inside. There must be a room within a room. Come on, Porky. They're going back inside that house. Only this time, uninvited and unseen. You think maybe the room is up around here, Jeff? Just keep trying, Porky. Run your fingers over every inch of wall and furniture. Yeah. Got something? Heart failure. I get a splinter in my finger. Why did I ever... Shh, quiet, Porky. I think I've got it. No kidding? Get over here. Have your gun ready. There's a little knob here in back of the bookcase. I think it will swing the bookcase open and lead us into another room. Here goes. Look out, Porky. Oh, you've come to kill me, but I'll kill you first. I'll kill you if you come near me. We haven't come to kill anyone. Who are you? I'm Mrs. Putnam. What? Mrs. Put... Jeff, there's the ghost we needed to top off everything. Hey, light a match, Porky. Oh, there's a candle over there, Jeff. All right, light it and bring it over here. Okay. How do we know that you're telling the truth, that you are Mrs. Putnam? Heaven knows I am, but I wish I were someone else. I've gone through so much. If you are Mrs. Putnam, then who is the dead woman downstairs? The dead woman? Yes. She's my cook. She took suddenly ill and died earlier this evening. Your cook? I can prove to you that I'm Mrs. Putnam. How? My signature. I signed a new will tonight. They forced me to will everything to them. Oh, you must believe me. We'll check on that. Was there any shooting in the house this evening? Yes, yes. They shot my dog while the poor creature was trying to protect me. I called the police to help me. I thought they meant to kill me, but instead they brought me up here to face the living dead. We're the police. If you are Mrs. Putnam, then we're here to help you. Thank heaven you don't know how they tortured me to make me write a new will. You say the new will leaves everything to them? Yes, In that event, it will be a simple matter to trap them and for you to prove yourself. Have you got the old will? No, they destroyed it. Well, it doesn't matter. You'll tell me the contents of the old will. They'll give themselves away when they hear it read. And now, Mrs. Putnam, about those who tortured you. Who are they? (laughs) 
I'm grateful to all of you for not objecting to my presence at the reading of this will. Well, having you here, Detective Hanson, is best for all of us. We're really obliged to you for your kindness. Thank you, Miss Putnam. And now, if all of you don't mind, Dr. Holloway, Mr. Putnam, Williamson, Adams, I'll be brief. Oh, Porky, wheel Mr. Putnam's chair a little closer. Right, Jeff. I had the courts appoint me to see that this will is made valid and legal. Now, this is it. I, Martha Putnam, being of sound mind and body, do hereby bequeath my entire fortune and all my worldly goods to Joel Adams, no. my partner. Oh, no, you've made a mistake. Careful, Lois. What did you say, Miss Putnam? That isn't my aunt's last will. Lois. No, I must confess, Miss Putnam, that isn't in your aunt's last will. Then what do you mean by reading that? My aunt left everything to me. Please, Lois. You're right, Lois, I did. In the will you forced me to sign. Mrs. Mrs. Putnam. Don't Don't move, Doctor. Yes, Lois, I signed a will leaving everything to you. That's true. But only because you and your darling doctor forced me to. Oh, I never dreamed that my own flesh and blood would be that selfish. Just a moment, Mrs. Putnam. The conspiracy to spirit you away and bury the cook in your place was entirely my idea. Don't blame Lois. It was a clever plot, my friends, and it might have worked, but... Fortunately, you made mistakes. By the way, Doctor, does that bandage on your hand cover a nasty bite you got while doing away with the dog? Yes, it does. I confess to everything, Mr. Hanson, but Mrs. Putnam is as much to blame as anyone. Everyone who ever lived in this house hated her. With all the money you had, Mrs. Putnam, you never did one decent thing in your whole life. You distrusted everybody and hurt everybody. And so we plotted to get you out of the way. Fate was kind enough to provide us with your cook as the means. With your money, we could have gotten something out of life. You'll get life now, all right, without her money. Ah, you can relax now, friend. This story is over. But still another plot is being formed for our next session in the inner sanctum. Are we scared? Sure, but what of it? Isn't the villain a great deal more frightened than we? But thanks to clever sleuthing, everything will be solved. And uh, there's one more mystery we may be able to solve for you quite easily. When you don't feel good, when you're low and irritable and the whole world looks black and uninviting, try Carter's Little Liver Pill. Don't give in to that depressed feeling that bogs you down. Go to your nearest drugstore right now and ask for genuine Carter's Little Liver Pills. Regular size, 25 cents. There now. We've closed the door to the inner sanctum for another week. Time to go. But spread the news to all arch criminals that we shall ride again in their pursuit next week. This is no laughing matter for them, my friend, so take your tongue out of your cheek. That's better. <laughs> Remember, we'll expect you next week at this same time in the mysterious circle of the inner sanctum. Oh. Uh, by the way, you like good mystery stories, so be sure to read this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery, The Case of the Solid Key, by Anthony Boucher. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. first letter seemed harmless enough, possibly even just the result of a mistaken delivery. The second one drew concern, and paired with the unexplained visions of something darkly unsettling, Sam Morris finally caves. The everyman safe world he lives in is about to take a drastic and dark turn. He quickly falls into a world of insanity, the morbid and the macabre he's drawn into a darkness that is just as deadly as it is mysterious. A darkness that dwells in a house that could only be conjured up 
by a mad brain. It is a house that calls you, a house that haunts you with its ghosts. They'll scratch and claw through your fragile hide, bringing madness bubbling to the surface. Come see the ghosts for yourself, if you dare. Weird Darkness Publishing presents Of a Mad Brain by Scott Donnelly, now available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook versions through Amazon and WeirdDarkness.com. The Fairport Harbor Lighthouse is located on the shore of Lake Erie in Fairport Harbor, Ohio. Being built at the mouth of the Grand River, it was originally known as the Grand River Light and was one of many lighthouses used to guide ships in and out of the Great Lakes. Constructed in 1825, the tower and house soon fell into disrepair and had to be rebuilt in 1871. The Fairport Lighthouse and Keeper's House are still standing today and it was used until 1925, but then was abandoned for a new lighthouse that had been erected nearby. The haunted Fairport Harbor Lighthouse is 70 feet high, built of sandstone and no longer operational. The Keeper's House is now home to the Fairport Marine Museum and was the first U.S. lighthouse grounds to be restored into a museum in 1945. The museum houses many nautical and historical exhibits important to the local region. There are two prominent lighthouse keepers in the history of the Fairport Harbor Lighthouse. The first keeper of the lighthouse must be noted, Samuel Butler, as he was also an active abolitionist and made the haunted Fairport Harbor Lighthouse a northern terminal of the Underground Railroad, effectively guiding runaway slaves to the safety of Canada. This history of the site alone makes it a possible site to be haunted, but the second lighthouse keeper seems a fixture and remained very attached to the lighthouse of Fairport Harbor, which he loved. Captain Joseph Babcock was the first keeper of the reconstructed lighthouse and keeper's dwelling, who also raised a family on the grounds. In fact, two of his children were born in the home, with one of them dying young at age five from smallpox. The tragedy of losing Robbie at so young an age certainly weighed heavy on the family, but Mrs. Babcock also had fallen ill and remained bedridden inside the house. For entertainment, she reportedly kept many cats. Many years later, some claimed to have seen a ghost cat whisking about upstairs, describing it as a gray puff of smoke. Interestingly, a mummified cat was found by a worker years later, and it's now displayed at a glass cabinet at the Fairport Harbor Museum to this day. The AngelsGhosts.com team were fortunate enough to be able to investigate the haunted Fairport Harbor Lighthouse and see what they could uncover. Working with different members of the ghost hunting group Sight, they were able to make some ghost box recordings in the tower and lighthouse keeper's house. Is the Fairport Harbor Lighthouse haunted? If they were to compare reports from guests and volunteers with the recordings of ghostly messages that they received, they believe it is indeed haunted and a jewel of a lighthouse worth visiting. The Haunted Lighthouse on the White Lake Channel of Lake Michigan is known as the White River Light Station. Built in 1875, the first lightkeeper, Captain William Robinson, took his post in 1876 and raised 11 children with the help of his wife Sarah at the White River Light Station. In fact, they loved the lighthouse and duty so much that they stayed there for 47 years, and upon retirement, they saw their son become their successor. Yet the captain refused to leave the lighthouse, and he worked at the White River Light Station into his 80s. At age 87, he eventually died, the very night before he was supposed to leave the premises for good. Today, the haunted lighthouse is believed to be watched over still by the captain and his wife Sarah. His ever-distinctive cane and gait can sometimes be heard walking around the light station, while Sarah makes her presence known by tidying things up from time to time. The haunted White River light station was officially decommissioned by the U.S. Coast Guard in 1960, 
but it is still open today as a museum. The Big Bay Point Light sits overlooking Lake Superior in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, being built in 1896. The Big Bay Point Light is made of red brick with a square lighthouse tower that's attached to the keeper's house. It was fully automated in 1941, later decommissioned by the U.S. Coast Guard from 1961 to 1990, and is now operating again as an active aid to navigation. After it was shut down in 1961, the property was purchased by Dr. Pick, via a sealed bid, who lovingly restored it over the next 17 years. Eventually, he sold the property to the partners who still own it today. When it became a bed and breakfast, apparently the resident ghost felt it necessary to help innkeeper Linda Gamble with things, but after she was woken up in the middle of the night by slamming cupboard doors in her kitchen, she angrily told the ghost to stop. Reportedly, today the ghostly activity has settled, and she believes there to be five resident ghosts, though we're not sure just who all of them are. There was a soldier stationed there in 1952 who committed murder at the nearby Lumberjack Tavern, an incident that was the inspiration for the book and movie Anatomy of a Murder. But he only murdered someone there, he didn't die there himself, so why would he have stayed to haunt the Big Bay Point Light? There is another story that might answer at least who one of the ghosts at the haunting Big Bay Point Light might be. Linda believes the ghost banging the cupboard doors was the first lighthouse keeper, William Pryor. Mr. Pryor began his lightkeeping duties in 1896 and stayed only five short years. He was looking for an assistant and found the perfect helper in 1899, his son George. Unfortunately, in 1901, George had an accident and was injured by falling down some steps and eventually died in a hospital. A month later, William Pryor walked away from his lighthouse duties and into the nearby woods with his gun and some strychnine, being presumably grief-stricken for his son. His body was eventually found by a hunter 17 months later in 1902, a skeleton hanging from a tree in the woods not too far away from the haunted Big Bay Point Light. His tragic suicide and grief could be why his ghost still remains at the lighthouse to this day, and his bright red hair is seen in the mirrors of the property. Plymouth Lighthouse was originally built in 1769 at the mouth of Plymouth Bay in Massachusetts. The original structure had two towers lit with oil lamps, being built on the property of its eventual lighthouse keepers, John and Hannah Thomas. Hannah became a very capable lighthouse keeper herself as John went off to the Revolutionary War and was killed in battle. In fact, she became the first woman lighthouse keeper in all of America. Some believe Hannah still resides at the location even today, even though the original Plymouth Lighthouse was lost to fire and rebuilt in 1803 with a new building and even taller twin towers. 1843 saw both towers reconstructed, and by 1924 the Northeast Tower was removed as it was no longer needed. The haunted Plymouth Lighthouse South Tower has continued to operate since that time, but today it is automated. However, in 1998, the lighthouse had to be moved again due to fear of losing the structure because of erosion. A professional lighthouse photographer and his wife decided to spend the night at the supposedly haunted location, choosing to sleep in a house adjacent to the lighthouse. He awakened in the middle of the night to find the upper half of a woman floating above his sleeping wife and staring at her. The apparition was in a period dress and had long, dark, flowing hair. Could this woman have been the original owner and keeper, Hannah Thomas? Many people believe so. The Battery Point Lighthouse was formerly known as the Crescent City Light Station, and it is a unique lighthouse because it's situated on Battery Point Island. It only sits on an island during high tide, though, Otherwise, it could be accessed from the mainland at Crescent City, California as a peninsula. Being built in 1856, this Northern California lighthouse 
decorates the Pacific Ocean as a two-story white granite stone house with a white brick lighthouse tower atop. Today, it can be visited as it is a museum and also remains operational as an aiding light for navigation, though it was decommissioned by the U.S. Coast Guard in 1965. Being fully automated, the haunted Battery Point Lighthouse has had its share of stories. A year before it was to be deactivated, the lighthouse keepers witnessed an unfortunate tragedy. A tsunami occurred in 1964, creating huge tidal waves that destroyed seven city blocks of Crescent City. The keepers were eyewitnesses to the destruction, being threatened themselves by the largest of waves from the ocean. The lighthouse is haunted at Battery Point, but no one seems to know exactly by whom or why. There is believed to be at least one resident ghost which is playful. A paranormal research group that investigated the Battery Point Lighthouse believes it's haunted not by one playful ghost but by three, a child and two adult specters. Some of the haunting activity being reported occurs when visitors are given a tour. Some guests have experienced being touched on their shoulders and sensing a presence. Caretakers report having their slippers moved at night while they're asleep, a rocking chair moving back and forth on its own, and sea boots trudging up the haunted lighthouse stairway as if still on duty, especially during times of storms. Even cats at this lighthouse have acted strangely during times of ghostly activity. There's still more weird darkness to come with more of the world's most haunted lighthouses up next. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marler. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, Check out Mind of Marler on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marler. Every door has a key. There's a key to every situation. Behind every unopened door, there is a mystery. And the opening of this door introduces us to another in the series, the key. Elena, look who we have here. Look who has come to visit us. Alexis. Alexis Chernovsky. Uh, my dear Elena, how good it is to see you again. How very good. But Alexis, you did not say you were coming. Uh, you did not give us warning. Oh, I couldn't. I had so little time. These things happen suddenly. Uh, trouble? Yes. <laughs> trouble. Much trouble. I will tell you about it. <laughs> Let me take your coat, Alexis. Your hat. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. But you should have told us you were coming. You could have had a bed. You could have stayed with us. You are too kind, Herzog. Too kind. But, but I have arranged to stay elsewhere. I know you do not want to be troubled with another. It is hard enough for us to make our own living in a new country. Oh, <laughs> what nonsense. Where have you been, Alexis? We have not seen you since... Oh, for so long... You have been in England always? 
No, no, really. I arrived here but a few weeks ago. Oh, sit down, sit down, Alexis. Uh, here, here, by the oh, heart. Most kind, most kind of you. <laughs> and how have you been, Elena? How have you both been? Oh, we are well. We are happy, in a way. But you, you have just arrived. Uh, how are things there? Not good. Not good. We have labor troubles, and, and we have troubles with ourselves. We, we have trouble with other people, too, which you, but you know about that. When you left, the country was, oh, how shall I say it, was uh, unhappy, unsettled. You left. My friends, I, I think you were wise to leave. If we had not, we would have never left. Uh, my friends, friends who came out afterwards, they tell me that as we left by the back door, the police were coming in at the ground. So I believe. For myself, well, I had more time. Uh, time? Had talk, my friends. But one time I was in the government party, which, oh, may we be forgiven, thought that you were unworthy to live. Now I know better. Now another government party thinks that I am unworthy to live. So here we both are in England. Full circle, eh? Uh, Alexis, mistakes in the past have nothing to do with the future. Political feelings run high in our country. <laughs> Shall we say, in the heat of the moment, you thought I was wrong. Now, in cooler-headed times, I think perhaps you were right. Right or wrong, it does not matter. We are friends again. <laughs> uh, but what is this about a new government party? We have not heard of any government changes. Oh, perhaps I do not explain myself well, Elena. The party to which I belong has not changed. It is I who have changed. My views are now different from the party in power. And it is safer to change one's views outside our country than inside. <laughs> that is why I'm here. Oh, then you have the same views as my husband now. Precisely. The party to which I belonged made many grave errors. People were killed. There was suppression and confiscation of property, imprisonment. So I think to myself... A government making itself so hated cannot be a good government. Ah, oh, it is over. It is finished. We will discuss it no further. We understand. Politics make no difference when old friends meet. And uh, what are you doing here, Alexis? Have you got a job? Oh, a job is not so easy. Oh, but you speak excellent English. I will find work to do later. Of course you will, Alexis. It takes time to settle down in a new country. Things are different here. The government in power does not need to suppress the other party in order to exist. <laughs> it is what they call muddling through. <laughs> <laughs> not like our country. <laughs> no, there, there we plan. If things go wrong, we stick to our plan no matter how stupid circumstances make it seem. As your party did, us of. <laughs> they were determined and determination always is its own destruction for human beings resist another's determination. <laughs> ah, well, it is no good crying for what is past. <laughs> yeah, like that book of yours, Hetzog. Book? Oh, my political books are forgotten now. Oh, the one I am thinking of is not. <laughs> when they searched your house after you had left... They found it. But I had no hidden books. The one with all the names in it. The, the, the names? Hmm. The names of all your party. At least I, I think it was that. We examined it, but it did not make sense. Oh, oh that book. Ah, that book. What book was that? That book. When you said they would be coming for us, we destroyed everything, I remember. Oh, it was a book, a book I thought they would not find. <laughs> to be true, I did not bother about it. It was a code. No, uh, not a code, a, uh, a cipher it is called. 
Ah, a cipher. One that cannot be decoded unless the one who would decode it has a key. Usually a sentence in a book or something like that. And that one was impossible to decode without the key, so it does not matter if they did find it. But are not your children there? Your mother? If they, the authorities were to find that out, surely they would use it to make you give them the key. I mean, ladies can have their property confiscated. They can become the charge of the state and be treated accordingly. And children? Children can be sent to state institutions. Those institutions we know about, they have to... I should... I should think about it if I were you. I... They have forgotten the key. Have you? Then I should remember it. Alexis, you have not changed your politics, have you? Oh, yes. My party has disowned me. I do fly. That is why here in England they have welcomed you. me. They sent you here. You have come to get the key to that cipher. You wrong me, Hedgehog. Of course, if I had the key, then I could inform them of it. That would only be a duty. And the children? My mother? Well, for them, I cannot say. If the government were able to decode that book, I'm sure they would be grateful. They might even see to it that your mother and the children were given exit permits and allowed to travel to England. You bargain. You come to our house as a friend and then you bargain. My dear Elena, there's no bargain about it. I am quite sure the government would take what steps they think necessary in regard to the children. After all, they have been abandoned. They are now children of charity. The government's charity. Of course, I do not want to look on the black side or cause you unnecessary alarm. But the government be quite within their rights if the children were confined to the institution that puts on. You won't do it. You can't. My children have no political meaning. They are children. The sins of the father. Alexis, you will go. You will go before I kill you. Pause, my dear Hertog. Consider the position. Although you are in England, we consider you are still subjects of our country. In the event of my demise and your absence from home, it might be legal for us to punish the children in place of you. And if it isn't legal, we will pass a law making it so. It is easy for us to pass laws. <laughs> I see you get the point. There's something I can do. There must be. Hmm? I will explain to the authorities here. I will go to the United Nations. Oh, my dear, yes. I will denounce you. They will arrest you. I will tell them you are a spy, that you are still of the government in power. Do so by all means. Unfortunately, though, my government has already publicly disowned me. In the face of what I think, the authorities here will not believe you. There are thousands of us here. There are a hundred free men within 50 miles of here. I will call them together. If we cannot think of some way to defeat you, we will try you ourselves and have you put out of the way as the dangerous beast you are. Certainly, certainly. Oh, while you're about it, my dear heads, I'll tell them, remind them, impress upon them that they themselves have so many relations and friends at all. Their dear ones. Sisters, brothers, uncles, aunts, mothers, as you have. And I doubt they will be so militant as you. And if you do not like to remind them, I will. Somehow, somehow, I will beat you. Somehow, I will kill you. Threats. Ah, oh, me so many empty threats. Well, I really must be running along. As an ex-member of the government, I have many calls to make. Many people to see. It is amazing how eager they are to confide in me now that I have fallen from grace. They will not be, not after they hear what I have to tell them. Oh, yes, I meant to tell you. If you should spread any vicious lies about me to them, I shall have to instruct the home government to remove your mother to some safe place. For her own protection, of course. <laughs> well, goodbye. Goodbye, then. I'll call back about this time tomorrow. Think over what I've said, won't you? Parents and children are such a responsibility, aren't they? What do we do, Herzog? He can't mean what he says. He does. Though I don't know, I don't know. 
Everywhere I think, everywhere my mind goes, she's there. We shall go back. We will have to go back. For them to have us as well as our children? We can't leave them alone. Not alone, not now. No, no. I, I will go to them. I too. Unless perhaps... You give him what he wants to know. Even if I do, there's no guarantee the children will be safe. I I must go alone. I must somehow bring them here to England. You go back to Canada. No. Alone, I might be able to do something. If you come, it will mean that they have us all in their hands. You could say to Alexis, I will give you the whatever it is he wants. If you will bring the children here. He would never agree. He would say, give me the key to the site and then I will send your children to you. I will think about sending them. He has the upper hand. Whichever way you think or look at it, he has the upper hand. Passport, visa, yes, some money, and clothes. Yes, I'd see everything, Elena. I, I leave you now. You must come back, you will. Of course I will come back. Die. What is this sadness? I'm going to my home. I will see my mother again, and I will see the children. I will not only see them, I will bring them back here. You will, I'm sure you will. Of course. Now. The bright smile, the confidence. We have had troubles, but we have lived and we will live again. All of us. You said Alexis would be here for... Will you go with him? Is it wise to go with him? He wants the key to the cipher. If I give it to him here, we will never see our children again. But if I go home with him and then give him the cipher, I have a much better chance of getting them away. But they will have you there. They will try you and find you guilty. There is hope. There is life. Now, it is all edged. Alexis comes here. We go back together. It is a triumph for him. He has me. He will have the cipher. Perhaps they will be lenient and let me have the children. But those names. The names of my friends. It, it will be another bloodbath. Elena, I cannot do it. I, I say to myself in this world, one must be tough. One must take advantage of things. So long as we are happy, what matters the rest? That is the modern creed. No, no, I, I, I cannot do it. The children. A man cannot sell his own soul, not even for children. One moment, I think yes, and then I, I think no. I, uh, I'm going crazy. I. Alexis. I will tell him. I will tell him no. No, I, I cannot do it. The passport, the tickets, they have gone. Go on, I tell him now, I I cannot do it. I cannot do it. My dear old boy, do what? Oh. Well, I say confusion, what? It takes. Uh, who are you? Well, what you be your dear old boy? No, you're Scotch. Still, I'm very well. I'm sorry I kept the drift, but I do not understand. And my dear old boy, isn't that the way with all of us? I'm brown. Not Sam Brown or Brown off, but brown. Of the home office, don't you know? No, the British Home Office. I'm a public servant. You know, like the village pump. Anybody can use me. And they do, old boy. They do. Oh, uh, uh, won't you come in? Oh, thanks, thanks. Drop these, Danny, huh? Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, my wife, uh, Mr. Brown. Now, will you please explain? I, I am getting used to the British way of life, but not to the British themselves. Oh, well, it's perfectly simple. We heard you'd applied for a passport and a visa to visit your old home. So I totted along to find out what it was all about. Not that you have to tell me. We're curious, that's all. I... I wish to return for private reasons. Mr. Brown, you are English, so you would not understand. Well, being English means that I'm pretty dumb, but being dumb doesn't mean you can't understand. I understand a fellow called Alexis Chernovsky called on you. Him? He has nothing to do with England. Oh, he has, old boy, he has. Matter of fact, we've been sort of chasing after him, using the fox as a hound. Uh, please, I, I, I do not understand. We wish to be alone. Look, I know it's a frightful cheek of mine, poking my nose into your business, but uh, you've got a couple of children in your own country, haven't you? 
Okay. Ah, always travel there. Gives them a lead out. Well, I mean, after all, if you're here, you're sort of under our protection, aren't you? There's no protection. There's no... A moment, Herzog. Go on, Mr. Bart. Well, we happen to know that Chornovsky bird, he's a bit of a rat. Uh, confused in my metaphor, I know, but you get the general trend. Yes, yes, go on. He's here under two flags. Pretending to be the one, really the other. If you know that, why don't you arrest him? Mm, difficult, I think, you know. Being more or less a free country. Means it's free for one type, but it must be free for another. After all, this Chornovsky is not actually breaking any of our laws. Visitors aren't prohibited, you know. Please, please, you talk, you talk, you do nothing. But you would help us if you told us what he's really up to. He... Elena, you know what he can do if we tell this man. You know what can happen to our children. One cannot fight threats by doing nothing. All right, tell him. He came here. He wished to find out a... A, a, a key a, to a cipher. A key to a cipher. At home they found the book. They could not read it unless they had this key, which only my husband knows. It contained the names of his friends. Men whose lives are not safe, should they be known. Chernovsky said if my husband did not give him this key, our children would suffer. My husband thought... And then he, he thought he would go to our country with Alexis. Perhaps he would be able to save our children. And then he decided he could not do this to his friends. When you came, he had decided not to go. I see. And it reminds me of the war. We had quite a neat gimmick, quite simple. We had a code, of course, a cipher and a key. But this key was a cut above others. As a matter of fact, it had three separate outcomes. Enemy would bash their brains out trying to break it. But when they did, there'd be three messages all saying different things. I, I, I do not see what this has got to do with us. Just chatting, war memories, you know. A bit of manipulating and you can do it with any code. Especially if you have one to work on. I'll oh, take your side, old boy. Um, what's the key? You expect me to tell you? Well, I hope you might. Well, never mind. I'll say it's any old key. D-I-P-S-O-P-X-T-L-J. Pronounced dipso voltage. Mr. Brown, we, we have great troubles. We, we have everything happening to us. Please, please go. We, we have no time for English jokes. No, no joke, old boy. Uh, and lady. It just so happens that Gypso, uh, what have you, is the key to a cipher. I just made it up. It's mathematical. You take one letter less in the alphabet for each letter. So D becomes C, I becomes H. And if you go right through, you'll find it spells Chornovsky. Chornovsky? Uh, Alexis Chornovsky? Yes. And if you take your key and the first cipher name in your book and uh, rearrange your key a little, you can make that Chornovsky. And that, you know, would embarrass the rest. Oh, well, I'll have to be running along. Hope I see you later. When you come back. Little Pip. Remember, all you need for a bigger rat is a bigger trap. That man is mad. Mad? Yes. But madness is its own sense. <laughs> The book, Herzog. Ah. All the names. Now we'll go in next door where the public prosecutor and some of my colleagues are waiting. My children, my, my mother. If I give you the key, are they at liberty to leave with me? Of course, of course. You will do nothing to stop us. Do you mistrust me? Yes. Why should you? <laughs> give me the key to the cipher of this book and you are at liberty to walk away. You will get it. Good. You show sense. When we leave, my children and my mother. You, my dear Herzog, are not in a position to bargain. You are in the country, your home, to be sure. But you are no longer a citizen of it. Beyond that door are guards. Your children are still here. Unless I have the key now, you will be shot and your children will never know freedom. I knew I couldn't trust you. The key, written on pieces of paper and enclosed in envelopes, now awaits in a town just across the border. I have given instructions, should I not return by tomorrow, those envelopes are to be posted. But you know the key, you have it in your head. And we have methods to get it out of your head, should you feel this inclined to reveal it. The envelopes are addressed to the president and to all members of the council. So? You might be able to stop one or two reaching their destination. 
But a number of those envelopes would get to the people I wish to get them. My dear Herzog, I detect a certain amount of threat in your tone. I am threatening. When my children and my mother and I are across the border, I will give you the key. You will give it to me now. You insist? I do. Very well, Alexis Chernovsky. You make squares on a piece of paper <sighs> like this. Let's do it with a crossword puzzle. So, now, here you write these letters at the top. And here you write figures, 1 to 26. Diagonally across, you write the alphabet from corner to corner. Oh, very elaborate. So you could not break it. You take the first word in the book, the first name. Uh, Excalcius. Good. E is the fifth letter of the alphabet. We take five here. Huh? E at the top, and they meet at C. C is the first letter in that name. Uh, perhaps you would like to do the rest, huh? X is the uh, 19th. 19 and X, they meet at A. Oh, very clever. You are an pupil. Yeah. The name starts with C-H. Go on. C is the third, three, and C give all. Excellent, excellent. C-H, oh, go on. Next one is R. Chor. Go on. Uh, Chorn. You have got so far, you might as well finish the name off for yourself. Hmm? Important names, Chonovsky. Mm -hmm. Enemies of your state. Names of men you have sworn to liquidate. Chonovsky. Chonovsky. Well, Alexis, do we go through and tell the president, the public prosecutor? I have never been an enemy of this government. Perhaps not, but this book says so. Oh. The key to the cipher I gave you says so. Now, about my children. If you give orders for them to be rushed to the border with my mother and then myself, you will be in time to have those envelopes stopped. If not, <laughs> you have a hard time explaining your name in this book. Herr Zorg, I never had any intention of stopping you or your family. No, no, of course not. Well, either you agree or I take the book and the cipher next door. Oh, I agree. <laughs> Herzog, you are back. The children and mother will be here soon. Oh, now this is not a time for crying, Elena. Oh, let me hold you. <laughs> and Lena and Pietro, they are all safe. They will be coming soon. But Chornowski, the disciple. Oh, that man, the crazy, wonderful Englishman Brown. We have him to thank. At first, Chornowski would not let me see the children and mother. So I showed him one key which would decipher our code. And it put his name at the head of the list. He then agreed it would be best if I just had my family by me. I promised him then he could have the real key. He came back across the border with us, and I gave him another key. Useless, of course. But Chonovsky will still find his name on the list, under the heading of Underground Courier. So the rat is now a runner. Oh, you are safe. The children are coming. Nothing else matters now. Oh, ah, Lena, the English do not kiss with the doors open. Close the door. Close it quickly. A closing door finishes a story. Next week, another key will open another door to another story. Mystery. Romance. Or adventure. All start when a door is unlocked by the key. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, 
labs or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. One of the oldest cities in America, St. Augustine, Florida, is rich with history and ghosts. The lighthouse that stands at the end of St. Augustine's Anastasia Island was built in 1874, one in a long line of lighthouses that has served the city since Sir Francis Drake raided the village in 1586. St. Augustine has become a national historic site, drawing thousands of visitors each year. But visitors don't just come for the history. St. Augustine's years of service has left it with many ghosts, leading Jason Hawes of Ghost Hunters to dub the lighthouse the Mona Lisa of paranormal sites. After the original lighthouse established by the territorial American government eroded and fell into the sea, construction began in 1871 to build the lighthouse as it stands today. A man named Hezekiah H. Pitty oversaw the work. To entertain his restless children, he allowed them to play with a supply cart that ran back and forth between the lighthouse and the ocean. But on July 10, 1873, he would come to regret that decision. After a day of play, the two eldest pity children, Eliza and Mary, drowned when the cart toppled over into the water. Historians believe that a third child, a young African-American girl, was also killed in the accident, though her name goes unmentioned in newspaper reports. According to lighthouse workers, the mischievous spirits of these children still haunt the lighthouse today. Workers will find locked doors standing wide open the next day, and the sound of children's laughter can be heard in the stairwell. Music boxes sold in the gift shop inexplicably pop open, playing by themselves. Tour guides report multiple incidences of being touched or grabbed by ghosts while showing visitors around the lighthouse. Visitors to the lighthouse report catching glimpses of a young girl dressed in period clothing peering out from the lighthouse door or standing near an upstairs window. In 2009, a cell tower technician took a photo of his co-worker with the lighthouse in the background. The figure of a young girl in a long dress with long hair can be seen standing alone on the top observation deck. The ghosts of the young girls are friendly and don't engage directly with visitors. Unfortunately, there are other, less pleasant presences making themselves known at the lighthouse, including a figure who has come to be known as the Man in Blue. This specter has terrified many who have worked and lived in the house, following them down all 219 stairs from the top of the tower. One lighthouse keeper was so unnerved that he refused to live in the lighthouse any longer. Eventually, a Coast Guard officer who evidently didn't fear ghosts switched duties with him. Many believe the man in blue is the restless spirit of lighthouse keeper Joseph Andrew, who fell to his death while painting the original tower in 1859. Others claim the spirit is that of another lighthouse keeper who allegedly hanged himself in the tower. Visitors and staff report the overpowering smell of cigar smoke on the landing of the tower despite the fact that smoking is expressly prohibited on the grounds. Could it be that Andrew had a penchant for cigars? The St. Augustine Lighthouse hosts over 200,000 visitors per year, and it's open to the public daily. For those especially interested in the paranormal activity there, the lighthouse offers the Dark of the Moon Tour, a comprehensive tour of all of the haunted sites related to the lighthouse. If you like an intimate audience with the man in blue, private tours are also available. Big Sur, California has always been a dangerous place to navigate a ship, so sailors in the 1800s petitioned to have a lighthouse built there, especially after the steamship Ventura sank at Point Sur in 1875. In 1886, the U.S. Lighthouse Service Board 
allocated money to build the Point Sur Lighthouse. It was given its first keeper on August 1, 1889. On February 12, 1935, the USS Macon airship sank in 1,450 feet of water off the shore of Big Sur. The Zeppelin-like structure was helium-filled, had an aluminum frame, had a top speed of 80 miles per hour, and was 785 feet long. Of the 83 people on the airship when it crashed, two lost their lives. Today, Point Sur is a ghost town, and the lighthouse is totally automated and the buildings are under restoration. The most popular ghost seen at the Point Sur Lighthouse is a man in a keeper's uniform that is from the 1800s. He is seen at the visitor's center once in a while. In 1810, at Cooper's Point on St. Simons Island, Georgia, James Gould finished the construction of the first 85-foot St. Simons Island Lighthouse that began in 1804. In May of 1810, President Madison appointed James Gould as the first keeper of the lighthouse until he retired in 1837. During the Civil War, Federal soldiers invaded Georgia, forcing the Confederates to evacuate St. Simons Island. Before they left in 1862, the Confederates destroyed the lighthouse on St. Simons Island so that the Union could not use it as a navigational aid. In 1874, the U.S. government had Charles Kluski build a second St. Simons Island lighthouse that was to be built on top of the ruins of the destroyed one. The new one is 104 feet tall and has 129 spiraling stairs. In 1880, head keeper Frederick Osborne and assistant John Stevens got into a serious argument about Osborne's wife that ended in Osborne's death by gunshot. Stevens was never charged and became head keeper of the lighthouse. Years later, Stevens and many other people would hear haunting footsteps going up and down the staircase in the tower, possibly the footsteps of Frederick Osborne. Port Boca Grande Lighthouse is located on Gasparilla Island, Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico. Built in 1890, beach erosion eventually threatened the lighthouse, but it was saved by the building of a 265-foot granite jetty to form a basin. The Port Boca Grande Lighthouse marks the entryway into Charlotte Harbor. Still a working lighthouse today, it is part of the Gasparilla Island State Park and houses a museum as well. In 1986, the lighthouse was fully restored as a working lighthouse. After being decommissioned by the Coast Guard in 1966 due to disrepair and the structure becoming unsound, lighthouse keepers and their families stayed in the keeper's house from 1890 until 1951. The light was automated in 1956, but what makes the landmark haunted? The Port Boca Grande Lighthouse also served as the keeper's house. One of the lighthouse keeper's daughters passed away in the home due to sickness. It was either diphtheria or whooping cough that claimed her life. Legend has it that at midnight she can still be heard playing upstairs in one of the rooms, according to a former park ranger tour guide. The story of the young girl is not the only lore surrounding the Port Boca Grande lighthouse being haunted, though. There was another legend of sorts about this site. Some have claimed to see the headless apparition of a lady, believed to be a former Spanish princess by the name of Josefia. The pirate who gave the island its name, Jose Gaspar, was said to be madly in love with Josefia, whom he had kidnapped and brought to the island where he had buried his treasure. After professing his devotion to her, she is said to have rejected him. In a fit of rage, Gaspar took her head off with his blade and then buried her body on the beach where the lighthouse would later be built. Her head, however, is believed to have left Gasparilla Island with the pirate. Does she still search the beach for her head? Some claim so, and it does make for a great story. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, 
Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Everybody. This is a tale they tell of another Christmas, a Christmas 19 years ago. The Great War was over. War-weary soldiers and officers were at last being allowed to rest, to enjoy such recreation as soldiers might find. Leave areas were established in various parts of France, and at intervals, individuals were sent from the stations of their organizations to these areas, there to rest and refresh themselves for a brief period. The story properly begins on Christmas night, 1918, 19 years ago. A leave train was just coming to a halt in the station at Via Franche. Cet compartiment là, monsieur, il y a seulement un officier, c'est un français. C'est première classe, monsieur. Oh, merci, monsieur. I see the bite of mine. Here you are, mate. Ah, oh, merci, merci, monsieur Langley. Merci. <laughs> uh, nothing, uh, nothing, you know, chap. Uh, uh, Australian. Uh, Enjek. Uh, complete. Ah, oui, 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 oui. Vous êtes Australien, n'est-ce pas? Right, oh. And uh, Merry Christmas, old chap. Un joyeux Noël, monsieur l'Australien. Excuse me, Monsieur, but I, uh, uh, si vous plaît, I, I would like to, uh, 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 venir ici. Oh, blast it, I can't talk the ruddy language. It is not necessary to speak the blasted language, Monsieur, since I speak yours after a fashion. Oh, beg pardon, old chap. Uh, the station master told me you wouldn't mind if I stowed myself in here with you. Uh, I hope. I should be very glad indeed of your company. I am Captain Esme Rochefort de Gascois. At the 212th Regiment Artillery, GPF. I'm uh, Lieutenant Horace Ballantyne of the Australian Light Horse, sir. Uh, you are welcome, monsieur. May I help you with your baggage? I'll have it stowed and have top. Uh, thank you. Uh, there. Oh, going on leave, Captain? Oui. I am not sure where yet, but c'est la guerre. One never knows where it goes in this world. Uh, too right, Digger. Oh, jolly good of you to share your compartment, old chap. I am only too glad. It has been rather a lonely journey so far. I am delighted of someone to talk to. Uh, First-class compartments are not too easy to copper, either. Uh, a bit cliché, this, isn't it? Not too bad, indeed. Uh, you'll pardon me, I know, but I am a bit curious to know how an Australian officer should find his way to Via France. <laughs> I don't quite know myself, Captain uh, Gascon, is it? Uh, yes. And your name is uh, Valentine? Right. I must remember. Well, uh, I was at uh, Gallipoli in the infantry with the Execook, the third officer division, you know. 
got a bit of a crack in the head, and the first thing I knew, I found myself transferred as town major in a village a few miles east of here. Nothing but Americans in it. Oh, the America. Uh, they are good soldiers, eh? Fair dinkum. And now you find yourself bound for leave on Christmas night. right oh, and jolly glad of it. Hmm. Where are you going, do you know? Uh, report to the RTO at Isle of Bain. That's all I know. <laughs> you have the same difficulties in your army, I see. One never knows where one goes. You are a long way from home, my friend. Right, oh, a bloody long way. <laughs> Halfway around the world, you know. And you have come to fight for France. I salute you, monsieur. Uh, it's been fun. We. Oui. And now it is over. And our young men lie dead under the stars out there. Uh, we lost a few, too. Our young men, monsieur. French, British, Australian, American. Not to mention a few German chappies. Quite. Eh bien, one cannot make the omelette without breaking the eggs. A bloody lot of good eggs, friend Gascon. We. Oui. I wish the blast of time would start. <laughs> it is always a mystery how they control these trains. Particularly when one wishes to go somewhere in the hurry. Oh, American chap out there, looking for a price, I fancy. Uh, perhaps we could invite him in here if you do not mind. Well, why not? It's all right with you. Oh, he is a comrade and there is little room on the train. Right, though. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. This is why, Yank. He comes? But me pink now. The blight is black. And an officer, too. So? I have heard that the Americans have two divisions of Negroes, and they have many officers who are, as the Americans say, colored also. But I have never seen one. You don't mind if I ask him? My dear Valentine, why should one mind? Is he not a man, an ally, an officer? Do we dislike one another because I am French and you Australian? Good chat. Ah, uh, we've lots of blacks in our units. What the devil's the difference? What difference does it make what color the brighter skin is? Uh, oh, yes. A uh, room here. Uh, do you mind awfully, Lieutenant? Uh, not much room anywhere else, old chap. Oh, come in, come in. We've room for one. Oh, thank you. I was afraid I was going to be left behind. My name's Valentine, Lieutenant Australian Light uh, I'm Captain Melvin, 370th American Infantry. Delighted, Captain. And this is Captain... <laughs> I have to help the chat out, Captain. <laughs> I am Captain Esme Rochefort de Gascoin of the French Artillery, Captain. Welcome. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you. Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, give me your musette. I'll shove it up in the rack. Oh, thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, feels good to get that thing off my shoulder. Uh, sit down, Captain Melvin. Mm, thanks. Been standing around there all day long on one foot and then on the other waiting. Finally, when the train did pull in, I thought I was still going to stand there. Good of you to take me in. We are delighted. Right, sir. You're an Australian, eh, Lieutenant? Right, sir. From Edward. I just think of that. Where are you from, Captain Melvin? Oh, I'm from Chicago. And you, Captain Desquan? Uh, my home is in Bayonne, as one might infer from my name. Your name, Captain? Desquan. Bayonne is in Gascony, you see. Oh, oh I see. The way. <laughs> it's odd, isn't it? Here we are, three of us in one railway coach, bound for somewhere... We've come from all over the world to meet on Christmas night in France. Now, we don't even know where we're going, do you? Well, I haven't the slightest idea. Believe me, that's all I know. Uh, well, may as well have a spot of Christmas cheer, eh? I've got a rather good wine in my museum. And so far, not to be outdone in this matter, mes amis, I also have a bottle of Lacrime Christi. Tears of Christ. A very precious wine in these days, mes amis. I do not remember how I came by it, but suffice it to say, I have it. Ah, we are about to start, huh? <laughs> we are starting. Oh, a ruddy happy crowd out there at the station. Christmas. We steal Christmas, despite the fact that most of them all want to get out of the town and go somewhere. Hmm. Yeah, that's Christmas. I was down in Texas, in yeah. Logan. I was in the hospital at Marseille. And I, mes amis, had dinner with a German general. German general? Uh, captured on Christmas Eve. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Gentlemen, will you drink with me? Uh, with pleasure, we. Oui. If you will drink with me. And with me. Well, then, to Christmas, eh? Uh, yeah, the Christmas. The Christmas. 
You know, Hermione, you that's a bloody full of junk of all sorts. I was afraid I might have lost the bottle. The souvenirs, huh? Oh, yes. Silly toys and things that I picked up. Given to some kid somewhere. Lord knows I have few enough. I have gifts, too, in my musette. There is no one left of my people to give them to, but it is a sentiment. Sentiment for Christmas. Uh, suppose we all do that. Mine's packed with odds and ends. I didn't know if I'd ever get back to that outfit after this leave, so... I got some souvenirs together. Another drink, Miss Amy? Oh, not now, thanks, Captain. I'll wait a while. I think I shall, too. Quiet. Uh, this is a beautiful night, eh? Yeah, clear. You know, if the war was still on, I'd expect to hear someone shout, Lights out, Jerry's up. Have a lot of bombs land in our laps. I hope we are done with that, monsieur. Amen. Uh, no moon, though. Yeah. But look at them stars. Oh, see that one over there. You might imagine it to be the star of Bethlehem. Very bright, isn't it? Oui. Oui. Nearly 2,000 years ago. I wonder if that same star still shines upon the earth. If it does, we wouldn't know it. Not us. Fight wars and deny the name of the man that was born under it. A religious chap? No. Oh, not at all, Lieutenant. Uh, Long way from it. I'm not a religious chap either. Ah, uh, but you used to have some jolly times as a kid at Christmas time, though. Church things and all that, candles, what not. We, one is not religious, save when one sees the star shining down on him. I wonder if that could be the star. And why not, my friend? Our earth changes, but the everlasting stars change not. Yeah, it'd be funny if it is, wouldn't it? Uh, won't they? We... But our journey is long, gentlemen. If you wish to sleep... You I... sleepy, Captain? <laughs> that little drink of wine has affected me, I fear. I cannot keep my eyes open. Yeah, I'm a little tired myself. Stand round all day in that station. There was no place to sit down. Well, uh, I can always sleep myself. I propose, then, that we do sleep for a little while, my friends. Uh, talking to sleep <laughs> it made me sleepy. I'm all for it. Shall I turn down the lights? If you will, monsieur. Oh, pleasant dreams. Uh, Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas to you both, gentlemen. Yeah, and to you, Lieutenant Valentine, Captain Gascon. Yonder star shall watch over us. This part? The star that shone on Bethlehem. Uh, good night. Are you asleep? I'm not. Nor I. Almost, though, I must say. I... I was thinking. It seems that I have met you both before. Somewhere. Hmm. That's really odd. Why, my friend? I was thinking the same thing. Uh, I was, too. But it couldn't be. One from France, one from Australia, one from America. We, oui, it is so. Uh, good night, my friends. Good night. Good night. Friend Gaspar, we have journeyed far, and the sign that thou didst promise to us is not yet. Peace, Balthazar. We have not yet come to the end of our journey. Behold, Melchior crieth not out. Canst thou not study his patience to be like unto him? Yet thou art tired, Melchior. I, I am tired and weary. Yet must we go on. No man knoweth what the end of his far journeying shall bring him. Dost thou see, Balthazar? Thou must needs have faith. I have faith, friend Gaspar, that my burden upon my shoulder is cruel heavy, and I would fain rest. Have faith, O Balthazar. Have faith, I conjure thee. Faith. Aye. I lead on, O Gaspar. Whither thou goest, there will I follow thee. And also I, Gaspar. 
For I know that thou art inspired of God, that his hand doth lead thee. Yet not even I know what miracle he will do before our eyes. No matter. We will follow and thy road lead to death. Now, which road takest thou? That to the right hand or, or to the left? I know not. Wilt thou not call upon God, Jasper? I kneel down, brethren. O oh Lord, Father God, lead us, thy servants, in the way thou didst set out for us. For know, Lord, Father God, that we are poor, and our eyes know not the right, and we would follow the way that thou wilt have us follow. Therefore we pray thee humbly, dear Father, a miracle. A miracle? What sayest thou, Balthazar? Behold, Gaspar. A sign from the Lord, Father God? There is no sign. Behold! In the sky. A sign. A star that burneth brighter than all the stars of the heavens. O oh, Lord God, we thank thee. The way is before us. We follow thy will. Behold, Gaspar. The star shineth upon the pathway to the left. Forward. Forward, brethren. For the end of our far journeying is at hand. Certes, this is a sign from God. Behold, Gaspar, beyond the hill, the lights of a village. It is so. Now we are come to our destination indeed. Haste, friends, haste. Tellest thou what town is that, O Gaspar? Nay, I know not. Save that it be the end of our long journey. O oh, travelers! Have you seen the stars? Who calls? Who art thou? It is a shepherd. See the flocks of sheep beyond the road? Seest thou the star, travelers? Knowest thou its meaning? Aye, we have seen it, O shepherd. Yet we know not its meaning. Save that a miracle of the Lord, Father God, is nigh unto us. And the blackness of the sky, it sprang into blaze, traveler. Dost thou think it portends the end of earth? Nay, friend. Not the end of earth, say rather its beginning. What sayest thou? Behold, shepherd, the mantle of the Lord is upon him. He speaketh of miracles. Aye, and a miracle will come to pass. Haste, friends, haste, for this night we'll hear the voices of angels chanting and the sound of many great wings. Peace on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Glory, 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 glory to, God. to God in the highest. Verily, he speak as men that understand the workings of the will of God. Say now, shepherd, how is yonder village named? Surely, if you know what shall come to pass because of the star, how is it you know not the name of the town? We have come from far land, shepherd. Aye, what matters it if we know not such trifles as the name of a little hidden village when we know of a miracle to be wrought in the name of Almighty God? Aye, it is so. What miracle shall come to pass? It is hidden from our ken, O shepherd. Yet it shall come to pass. Fear not. Aye. And such a miracle as shall set all the world to singing praises, lifting up their voices unto the heavens, crying in a loud voice, Mighty, mighty is the Lord God of hosts. He be not of Israel? Nay. I am from the land of the Greeks. And these, my companions, be also from far lands. Melchior from Ethiopia, Balthazar, um, a wise man of Egypt, a soothsayer unto the king. Ye have come far. Aye, so. Since many days our feet have trod the pathways of hidden, unknown places. Yet always have we set our faces unto the east, obeying the bidding of a voice unheard, the guidance of a hand unfelt. And ye go now into the town... Thou hast not told us its name, shepherd. Certes, all men know that yonder town is called the town of the house of bread, even Bethlehem. Know ye that I, even I, am of Bethlehem, where was born a thousand years agone, David, son of Jesse, that was king of Israel. It is well. For now I speak with the tongue of the Lord, the wisdom he hath put into my mouth. Behold, yonder Bethlehem, whence came David, king of Israel. Now this night shall be born in Bethlehem, 
that Messiah, that very Son of God, which the ancient prophets have foretold. And this is the miracle that shall come to pass, for he shall be born of a virgin immaculate, and his name shall be Jesus, called Christ. O thou Lord God, Father, I give thanks unto thee that thou hast appointed me and my companions, that we shall be witnesses before all the world that the Son of God is born. Haste, my friends. We must on, for the miracle is at hand. The Spirit of God is upon him. He speaks with the tongue of the Lord. Haste. O holy man, may I not go with thee, seeing thou knowest not the village, and I with my brethren was born there. Aye, thou mayest come with us, but haste, friends, haste. Behold the star, how it seemeth to beckon us on. Lo, it cometh down from the heavens and standeth above the rooftops of the town. It is the doing of God. Aye, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Sling thy breath and from thy shoulders, friends. Haste, haste. I marvel also that there should be lights abroad in the town. The hour is passing late, yet there is a light in every house. And perchance the men of Bethlehem rejoice that the Messiah is born. Nay, not so. For he is hidden from men, and they of Bethlehem know him not. Then what? The feast of Hanukkah is but lately over, my masters. The feast of the lights in memory of the Maccabee. And many remain. Also are there others in the town who have come to deal with the men of Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee, even the tax collectors, and thus is the city full, even all the inns. Dost thou know where we shall find him, O Gaspar? Hath it been revealed unto thee? All in good time, my friend. We follow the star. Perchance he shall be born in a family of high repute. Aye, it is not fitting that the Son of God shall come from an humble home. The will of God shall be done. The child Jesus be born in the wide fields under the star, my friends. Haste. Behold, these be the walls of Bethlehem, O wise man. Yonder lieth the gate. Perchance the soldiers of the Tetrarch may refuse his admission into the city, Gaspar. Nay, they are gone away, Melchior. Aye, they all lie in the inns and public houses and corrals of the people of the town. Gaspar, art thou sure indeed that we shall find him in Bethlehem? Dost doubt the word of God, Balthazar? On... On. Now, whither do we go, O Lord Gaspar? Nay, me not, Lord Shepherd. For we are all humble men in the sight of God. Praise God. Praise God. Behold how the rays of the stars shine down upon a certain street. It is the way, friends. Follow. Lo, one comes, Gaspar. In haste. Aye. A chance he knoweth. Oh, thou men, whither goest thou? Who art thou? Stand aside that I may pass. Who art thou? Know that I am a citizen, even as thou art. If indeed thou art a citizen and not a strolling player or hawker of false jewels. Oh, speakest thou thus to me, who am the great physician? Know, man, that I am Balthus, the leech, the learned, the clever, skilled in cupping and the art of the chirurgeon, the saver of lives, the bringer of babes into the world. Peace! A tongue like the say that of thou art chirurgeon, no man of Bethlehem. Aye, I am that. I am Balthus, wrestler with the angel of death, sometime physician and the great Antipater himself. I am... Hold, I pray thee. Hast thou attended woman this night that was brought of child? And how didst thou know that, stranger? Wilt thou say I or nay? Aye, I have done so. And look ye now. This night have I come upon a miracle, a very marvel, a prodigy of nature. Never before in all my time Wait, have I... cease thy clacking and speak, Leech. And who art thou thus to speak of the marvel that thou hast witnessed, man? Behold, not two hours have passed since one came post-haste, crying before my door. O Balthus, O most noble surgeon, O saver of lives, come down and haste. And I, setting down the goblet of sack posset wherefrom I did drink... Flung open the window and looked down. To thy story, leads. to thy story. Behold, crieth the man in the street. Behold, Balthus, a woman hath need of thee in the stable, nigh unto the inn of the two oxen. In the stable? Aye, in the stable. Now, I am a man of charity, and always ready to answer the call when sickness stalketh abroad. In the plague that came upon Bethlehem nine years ago. Aye, thou art always ready when thou dost smell the smell of gold, leech. Say on and quickly. If thou wilt but be still and let me. I spoke of a marvel. Say on, say on. I flung my cloak about me, and I came in haste, as he'll become a man of my age and girth, and yet I am charitable, I say, and behold, 
In yonder stable was a woman couched in the straw of a manger, brought to bed of a child. Surely women have been brought to bed of a child in stables before, Karajan. Aye, so. But mark me well now. This woman was a virgin. Nay. I swear it by the holy phylactery. By my father's beard, I swear it. Verily was a child born unto her, and she a virgin. <laughs> thou hast drunk too much of thy sack, posset, neighbor. Thou a physician. I swear, Old. my... Thou hast said enough, Leech. Verily hast thou stood before a miracle this night. A miracle? In sooth, a very prodigy. Where lieth the woman thou didst attend? In yonder stable. The man did say that they had come from Nazareth in Galilee to give his testimony unto the tax collectors. And though they beseeched the innkeepers, yet would none of them give them room, saving only this one, who, having pity upon a woman with child, did say unto them that they might find dead amongst the kine in his stable, and did charge them not. May all the blessings of God be on this innkeeper, that he hath offered shelter this night unto the Son of God. Hey, what says? And on thee, physician, for that thou didst lend thy hand unto her, who is the very mother of him who shall be the savior of the world. Verily, I know not who thou art, old man, yet I perceive that thou hast the gift of prophecy. If I have served, then I am glad, for I took naught from them. And the babe did look upon me with a look that I shall ne'er forget, though I live to be the last on the earth. Now I crave thy blessing. If thou dost speak sooth, I am most blessed among men. Verily shalt thou stand at the right hand of him who hath come to the earth, physician. Thine was the hand that first touched him. Verily art thou blessed. I thank thee for thy grace, friend. Go now inside the stable. I go to the temple to render thanks unto God. For verily, I believe thee. Now, my friends, it is the end of our long journey before us. Come with me, I pray, each of you. Come and fall down and worship the infant Jesus, Son of God, which will be called the Christ. Praise unto praise, him. Praise unto the Son of God. I will not go in. I am not worthy. Nay, shepherd. There be none of us worthy to touch his hand. Yet there be none too humble to do him reverence. Come. Aye, come, shepherd. The star. The star waneth a little. Shadows fall upon us. The star paleth before his glory. Nay. Nay, Gaspar. Behold... Behold in the sky a sign. A sign. Oh, Father, Lord God. A sign. The shape of a man crucified on a cross. Until, uh, oh, I say, uh, what's the matter? Uh, I was dreaming, I guess. Well, where, where are we? I, <laughs> it was a dream, but I saw you too. Uh, you saw us? It's hard to remember, but I... Did you, did you dream of three men, Melvin? I, yes. I... I did too. Gaspar and Melchior and Balthazar. Gaspar and Melvin and Valentine. Good heavens. Look, look at our shoes. All on us. What? Straw. Where's Straw the... Straw. From a stable. And that, that smell. What? Gentlemen, I have been in the East. I know what that smell is. It is myrrh and frankincense.
Lights Out, especially written for radio, comes to you each Wednesday at the same time from our Chicago studios. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 16, verse 8. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And a final thought, be brave enough to live the life of your dreams according to your vision and purpose, instead of the expectations and opinions of others. Roy T. Bennett I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. (laughs) 